will share with you what opportunities are present today and in the near future within their organizations. After a short introduction, I will turn it over to one of my colleagues, Rex Mudge. He's a leading expert in human resources and will show how to build a campaign to find that perfect job. Most people in the job market have a lot of misconceptions about the process and therefore it may take longer or worse result in major disappointments. Then we'll have two experts in the cyber market. One is a gentleman named Ian Mitchell, the former head of PricewaterhouseCoopers or PwC's Global Fraud and Financial Crimes Group. He now has his own company. And then we'll have Gerald Auger, who will be able to give some great insights on how to use LinkedIn as a tool. He too has his own company. You'll hear after he completes, once again, from our colleague, uh, Steve Olson, who will give instructions on what to do during the second two, the two hours from uh, seven to nine Eastern. Those two hours will be dedicated to employers who will be sharing up, we will have three simultaneous 30 minute Zoom sessions, which you'll have the choice of visiting. The employers will talk about their organization, the culture, the criteria for hiring, and how you as a CWCT grad can best present yourself and be recognized. I really encourage you to visit at least three employers. You can shift around when you're there, but before this session comes to an end, also use the time to ask questions, take copious notes, and if interested in positions or the organization, I encourage you to reach out. This is not a time to be shy. So this is, a, as I said, an exciting time to be in the industry. Just to share with you a site, www.cyberseek.org shows that as of the beginning of January, there are 597,767 open positions that employers are seeking to fill. Over the next three years, the experts are saying there'll be another 22 to 24% increase in that demand. And, and so you'll be uh, in today's session, hearing a lot of things, take notes, talk to your program people, talk to your instructors. This is your time. With that, I'm gonna pass on the, uh, and introduce my colleague, Rex Mudge. Rex, the mic is yours, sir. All right, thank you, Steve R. And uh, welcome everybody. I, uh, I'm uh, anxious here to talk about uh, interviewing and interviewing for success. I've only got 15 minutes and uh, Steve R took a minute of it. So I'm going to uh, talk rather quickly. This is about a subject I'm really excited about. And um, let me pull it up here for you. And I'm gonna talk about sort of interviewing for success. I've been in the HR business for uh, many, many, many years, more than I care to talk about. I've conducted thousands of interviews. I've uh, uh, looked at trying to hire for hundreds of different positions within many different industries. And let me just tell you, your work experience, your skills, your competencies, your education doesn't mean much to an employer if you can't present them well. Good talent alone doesn't present itself well. Excellent candidates, prospects for a job fail during the interview process because they're ill-prepared. And it's really disappointing. It's disappointing from an employer standpoint because your resume uh, obviously looks, it looks good, but it's also disappointing for the, obviously the interviewee. So I'm going to talk real briefly uh, about resume construction uh, and it'll be very brief. Dr. Auger certainly has uh, an awful lot of experience with that. He's got some videos to accompany that. And also there's a uh, individual Richard Lanthorpe. He wrote a book called Don't Use a Resume, Use a Qualifications Brief. And so when it comes to resumes, when it comes to qualifications brief, what's the best? What's the best spaghetti sauce? What's the best insurance company? What's the best um, movie to go see? There is a ton of information out there regarding this. So my point is, is that there's all this information out there, but I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to talk briefly about sort of my perspective. And my um, tip to you is you need to customize and you need to customize each of your 
resumes, each of your qualifications brief uh, to the employer's needs and their capability than the job descriptions. One size resume doesn't fit all employers. You need to have that customization. You need to be able to show your resume, your qualifications brief in a way that it aligns itself with those job descriptions, that job description that you're seeking. So my advice, when you're putting your resume together for a particular job, look at that job description, analyze those key sections of that job descriptions, look for the duties, the responsibilities, the minimum qualification, but pay particular attention to those words, those phrases uh, used in that job description, because if it's in the job description, you can pretty much bet it's a critical component for that job and it should be um, represented on your resume. A lot of content here in this slide, I'll be very quick here. But your resume, your qualifications brief should mirror to a great degree those skills that you possess and the requirements, the duties, the responsibilities that the employer has. And to do that, you can bullet point it with action verbs. And the reason I say action verbs is because when you use action verbs, it does create a little more enthusiasm within that written document that you're providing. An example, if in your uh, resume, your qualifications brief, you put on there, I help train new employees. Well, if you use action verbs, it could be I train new employees and formalize the training process for the company, or I conducted weekly meetings with client updates. Or if you use action verbs, it's I've spearheaded weekly status meetings, communicating revenue and client updates. There's a hundred, there are more than a hundred action verbs available and you're just a Google away. So when you're putting together your resume, your uh, qualifications brief, you can Google and get a myriad of action verbs to use. When you're formatting your resume or your qualifications brief, if you can highlight, if you can put your experiences, your education at the very top of your resume, um, it certainly will direct the employer's attention to those relevant and valuable skills and abilities and competencies that you have to offer. And again, um, the reason I say that is you want to put those key concepts, key terms in your resume, because when you submit it, there's an applicant tracking system. And that system, it's a software program, and it's designed to look at those resumes, those qualifications brief, and it discards those that don't include those key words, and it's programmed to do that. So as a job seeker, make sure you put those key words in that are in the job description into your resume, into your uh, qualifications brief, if indeed you do have those skills. And again, customize each uh, resume each qualifications brief for each of those jobs. So, and again, if you do this well, um, and you frame those experiences you have within the sections of your resume within your um, qualifications brief, you're already creating some excitement uh, from the employer standpoint before they even lay eyes on you. So uh, again, well constructed. Some quick tips for interviewing. You don't need caffeine that morning, forget the monster. You don't need to amp up your uh, anxiety uh, the day of the interview. And visualize success, okay? People are concerned, They're, they have negative views of interviewing, they create this negative sort of vibe about the interviewing and that creates additional anxiety. Look at it positively. Here's an opportunity for you to talk about your skills, your competencies. Uh, this is again about you being prepared to nail that interview. And how do you control those stressors? How do you get better uh, able to conduct that interview? Well. Couple of things, dress appropriately, but make sure you lay your clothes out the day before. You don't wanna be hunting around uh, the day of the interview looking for the appropriate outfit. Map it out, where are you going? If you're gonna go for a uh, in-person interview, uh, how do you get there? Make sure you get there 15 minutes early and use the restroom. I can't tell you enough, use the restroom, not only because uh, it helps mother's nature's calling, but in addition, while you're going there, you get to look at the employer. You get to look at the environment. Are the employees talking? Uh, do you hear laughter? What kind of environment is it in? So it gives you some sense, a little bit, uh, a sense of that employer. And be polite and be professional with everybody you meet because many interviewers after the interview is over with will go ask the uh, intake person, the receptionist, the recruiter, hey, did you get a chance to meet Rex? What was he like? And again, some people uh, use this technique. You've got this energy built up. How do you get rid of that energy so you're less nervous? Some people, when they're sitting in a chair waiting for the interview, they clench their fists as hard as they can to expend that energy. Some uh, stiffen their quads while they're sitting. And again, this is just a physical way of uh, releasing some of that energy. Make sure that you breathe during the interview 
And if they offer you some water, take some water. Who wants to have dry mouth within that interview? Typical interview, an hour. So uh, go ahead and do that and be prepared. Do your homework. Take a look at the company's website. Take a look at their LinkedIn, their mission, their vision, uh, their values. List your questions ahead of time that you'd like to explore with them. Bring copies of your resume because if you're uh, moved on to the next interviewer, chances are they may not have supplied them with your resume. So if you've got that uh, in your cover letter, that would be great. Also, you don't need to list references. Who in the world puts a reference on their resume, their qualifications brief, that isn't going to give them a positive uh, reference? So again, a lot of employers will specifically ask you for the references. Bring a pad, uh, notepad, and a pencil, and then avoid pontificating pompously just to show off. I was interviewing a entry-level accountant, just graduated from college. We were done with the interview. I asked him, do you have any questions? He says, yeah. He says, I'm just curious. Are you concerned that the stock price, your stock price today is um, inflated because your debt ratio to your competitors and to the industry is exceedingly high? And again, this is entry-level accountant, so you don't need to be showing off. And congratulate yourself. You're investing in yourself. You're going to be improving your brand as you're going through these interviews. You're going to be sharpening your skills. And quit worrying about the negativeness that comes out of uh, an interview where you, where you think you didn't do well. Quit flogging yourself. We're the only animal in the animal kingdom who will take a negative experience and continually flogging yourself day after day, year after year. So don't worry about it. Again, be professionally prepared. And how do you do that? How do you prepare yourself for something that you don't know what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to tell you what my secret sauce is. But one of the key elements is you need to practice. And then you need to practice a little more. And then you need to practice a whole lot more. So a uh, couple of mistakes. People can't articulate themselves well enough during the interview. They, after the interview, they think, oh, I could have I answered this question better. I could have presented a better example of this particular skill. Um, they're not prepared enough for the interview. You got about an hour. There's a certain flow with the interview. Some people get so long-winded that they go beyond that hour. Um, people are too nervous and they feel they can't ex exert any control over the interview. So they're always defensive. So there's a remedy. You can go online and you can look at about the 1,700 different interviewing questions that are out there and you can practice or you can narrow that 1,700 down to 100. And then you can look at the 100 strategies that are available to, to deal with those interviewing questions, which is uh, uh, futile. Or you can seize the moment. And what I talk about that is there's a lot of factors that go into interviewing. And so how do you, can, how do you exert a modest amount of control over your anxiety? And how do you put yourself in the best manner to nail that interview? And the main focus of the interview is it has to be your ability to communicate, to deliver your knowledge, skills, and abilities, present that information clearly and in the best light while telling your story. We're a culture of stories. So as you talk about uh, your background, your skills, your abilities, if you can do it in sort of a storytelling fashion, that kind of fits our culture. And it's about you taking control of that interview. COVID-19, uh, it's brought new challenges to the workforce. Recruiters, hiring managers, they've now had to do a lot of things virtually. And so now they're relying on using what's considered to be uh, behaviorally and situationally inter interview questions. It helps them get more information about a candidate, even though they're doing it online, uh, they're doing it virtually, but it helps them get a, uh, a little deeper meaning, a little deeper background about the individuals. So how do you, my, my idea of that secret sauce so you can nail that interview, before you head out the door for the interview, you need to focus on those skills, abilities, and knowledge that you possess, that you retain, and how they relate to the job description and responsibilities that you're applying for using the situation behavior outcome, or SBOs as I call them. So if you can approach each of that potential employer's knowledge, skills, and abilities, their duties, um, from a, that particular job description. And if you can create an SBO, a three minute story to illustrate and relate your experiences with that particular knowledge, skill, or ability, and then practice it, practice it, practice it. And I'll explain that here in a little bit. If you have well rehearsed situation behavior outcomes for the skills that you possess and how they relate 
to that particular job that you're applying for. That builds your confidence. Um, it's going to give you opportunities to showcase your experience rather than kind of just trying to figure out uh, on the fly, how am I going to answer this question? And again, you may answer that question without a lot of preparation, but is that really showcasing your best skill, your best um, knowledge or ability? And again, if you create these SBOs and you practice for each one of those job duties, job responsibilities in that job description, you're going to be better prepared to interview. Uh, and again, you probably are only going to be able to create maybe three SBOs, uh, or you're going to be able to address three skills, duties, responsibilities in a particular job. You're probably not going to be able to develop um, uh, SBO for each one of those skills and, and uh, duties. But if you can come up and address three of those skills, responsibilities, you've got a pretty good opportunity here to showcase yourself. So the interesting thing is, it'll help your interviewer understand the application uh, of your knowledge, skills, and ability. It gives them some context in the situation you were in when you exercise those skills, those responsibilities. I love interviewing the military, especially when they use the SVO, because the military is full of lots of jargon, lots of acronyms, and I don't understand them all. But if they tell me, if they explain to me the situation they were in when they were going to exercise that particular skill, it gives me a better understanding. And in addition to that, skills are transferable. If somebody in a volunteer organization talked about a particular uh, initiative they took on with that volunteer organization, and it's very complex and it involved a lot of planning, organizing, and executing, and it just happens to be one of the skills that I'm looking for as an employer, they can relate that skill to me using the situation, give me an understanding of what it's like to work for a nonprofit, give me an understanding of you know, the behavior, your action, what you did to execute, and what was the outcome. Those skills are transferred. Can you imagine if somebody can uh, deal with a complex situation in one particular company, one particular industry, and um, they've done a successful job, chances are those skills are transferable. So the more conversational you are, during that interview, when you're using these storytelling techniques uh, that are readily available for you to share, you're going to stand out amongst others. You're also going to improve that rapport between you and the interviewer. So SBO. I'm not talking about SOB. I'm talking about SBO. And SBO, that's where you're going to prepare specific interviewing. Uh, I, I suggest using flashcards and create two SBOs, situation behavior outcome, for each of those skills that are required from that job description. And again, you're not going to be able to do it for every particular uh, skill necessary for that job. But if you can do two or three, uh, you've got a good chance to uh, uh, do well in the interview. And again, this is if you've got those skills, you want to be honest, you want to be accurate. Uh, so you create that situation. Okay, there's a particular skill the employer is looking for. Uh, you think you have that skill. Well, tell me about your situation. Tell me about uh, the situation you were in. What was the background? What was the setting? Tell me about the problems that you faced in that particular setting. Help me understand the context in which you were working. Include the job, the school, or wherever it was. Uh, tell me and give me a better understanding of your role, the circumstances you were in, the constraints, the limits you had uh, in dealing with this particular problem. And then tell me about your behavior. And this is the, this is the rubber meets the road here. Now you can tell me how you executed, how you demonstrated your skills uh, that are aligned with that job description in solving this particular situation that you're describing to me. You could take action, take credit for your action. And then what was the outcome? And again, I'm interested in that. Outcome positive, negative. Carissa, this is Wim. Uh, you can mute yourself, please. Uh, anyways, outcome. You certainly want to talk about the outcome. And this is your time to close the story. Now, can you imagine if we're talking about a particular skill that I'm looking for or a particular um, uh, uh, ability? And uh, you come up with this SBO and you explain the situation behavior outcome. And then you close it and you say, by the way, 
I've got another sh uh, story uh, to talk about to share with you uh, how I've used this skill in the past. Who does that in an interview? Who volunteers a second situation, a second example to exhibit those skills and abilities you have? So again, you're taking control to some degree of the interview. You're creating this confidence now because you've developed these SBOs uh, for each of the skills that you want to talk about and you've rehearsed them. You have practiced them. You are now exerting some control. So you let's say you prepared now some solid, relevant SBOs for each relatable knowledge, skill, and ability that you have in this particular job. And you've practiced it, you practiced it, you practiced it. Practice re reduces your anxiety because you're well rehearsed, you're under control. You've done this repeatedly. You have to sink a 10-foot putt to win win a million five at a golf uh, at a professional golf tournament. How do they prepare for that? Well, they putted that. 10 foot putt thousands of times. Um, and again, it's practice, practice, practice. Um, they don't worry about their misses. They just worry about, or they just concerned about practice, practice, practice. And you gotta be careful because I've worked with uh, individuals before and we've practiced this and they wind up coming off as a bit arrogant because they seem so well prepared. So, and another situation, if an employer asks you a hypothetical question, OK, and you have an SBO, you have situation behavior outcome that can exhibit that particular skill, that particular ability. Can you imagine when they say, hey, you know, hypothetically, what would you do in this situation? And you say, well, let me share with you an, an experience I have uh, that uh, showcases my particular skill in that area. Wow. You talk about taking control of a hypothetical situation and applying your skills, your ability. That creates a real nice ebb and flow during that interview. Post-interview, revise your SBOs, continually revise those, continue practice. So real quick, this was a, uh, I've got a number of slides after this. I won't go through them, but this was a um, job description for a director of infrastructure and info. One of them was uh, duty and responsibility to develop and mentor staff. Question that's probably be asked of you. Tell me about a time where you've ever mentored anybody or how do you go about mentoring somebody? And then hopefully you compose uh, one of your SBOs or maybe two SBOs to address this particular uh, requirement by the employer. And again, tell me about the situation. Tell me about the behavior. Tell me about the uh, outcome and uh, about when you had to coach and mentor. I'll give you a quick example. I was interviewing somebody she was a senior uh, on a college hockey team. And I was talking about mentoring. And I said, you know, uh, tell me about mentoring. And now she's had no work experience. Okay, but she's a senior uh, on, a, on a women's hockey team. And she talked about, well, there was a freshman uh, coming from high school that was coming on a team. And she took it upon herself to sit down with the individual and review their strengths and their weaknesses. And then she decided to put together a program uh, creating objectives, short-term, intermediate, long-term objectives with smart goals over the off season to get that freshman hockey player at a level where she could perform at the collegiate level. OK, wouldn't it be nice if we were looking for people who could mentor, who had this ability, this skill? And this is a great example of somebody who has transferable skills. She certainly can put together a mentoring program, even though she has no work experience. So uh, here's another one. It's uh, dealing with problem analysis, decision making. Hey, Rex, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you. This is amazing information. I just want to let you I want to be respectful of time and everything. And this is I'm, great stuff. I'm closing it up. And great. These slides are available. Uh, after this, and there's a number of different slides available. So uh, with that, I will close it out and uh, uh, turn it over to Steve and Dr. Otter. And Rex, thanks for mentioning that. We had a number of people in the chat that requested the copy of this to, uh, information too. Yes. So yeah, if we can make that, that'd be awesome. Thank you so yep. much, Rex. No Steve? Rex, if you would just uh, release the screen. So I'm going to do that right and now. And I am going to pass on... Uh, at this point uh, to Ian. Ian, would you uh, join us? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, everybody, for letting me be a part of, part of this. Um, I do plan on sharing a couple of slides, if that's okay. Um, let me just do this real quick while I set up here. Uh, let's see. I know it always takes a second. Good to be here with everybody. I just want to say, you know, it is always a privilege and, and sure is a um, a great thing to be able to speak into people at this point in your careers. 
Um, I know Steve has filled me in on just uh, where you all are and, and what you're doing when it comes to what you're focused on. What I want to tell you is, and I'll give you a little intro about myself, but my hope is you get two things out of this with my time with you. One, um, I hope you understand purpose, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But the second thing is, is I do want to talk to you about financial services, and, and we are in need of some great professionals here. There's an amazing career ahead in the space of financial services to uh, fight things like financial crime and, and other types of threats that are going Going on. So just a little bit about myself. Again, Ian Mitchell, um, I am a founder of a nonprofit called The Noble. Uh, first of all, I'm a 25-year financial crime fraud fighter. I've been fighting fraud across over 22 countries. I've personally lived in uh, five countries, 13, I think the number is 13 states. I've uh, been all over the place. I, I've, I've worked in, and led fraud organizations of several hundred, um, a total of thousands um, all around the world, um, and have had a great career fighting fraud. Um, and and uh, I started also most recently a company called Omega Fin Crime. Uh, we, we are a, a company that is focused on fighting and reducing the impact of fraud, cyber-enabled fraud, scams, um, in the financial services space, um, and that's doing through consulting and technology and operations. So I'm based here in Chattanooga, and uh, and and so there's there you go a little bit about myself and hey, Ian, uh, a little yeah. bit more about yourself. This is Dave Garrett here in Chattanooga. So by the looks of what's behind you, you look like you might also be a musician. I am. Yeah, absolutely. I've been writing and recording music for the better part of, I don't know, 30, 35 years. When I wasn't overseas um, at Ally, when I was uh, with a global head of fraud there, I'd be touring around the country on the weekends in a van. So uh, it is an absolute passion of mine and, um, and, and continues to be. In fact, uh, you'll, you'll get a little taste of it here in a minute or two. Um, what I got to tell you is, is my, my going to the first topic Live a life of purpose. You know, this is funny. Um, I, I can't tell you how often, and, and Rex did a great job to tell you that I've had the chance to interview hundreds of people in my career. Again, really blessed career. But, but one of the things that, that really have sparks me is, is I haven't always hired the smartest person, the, person, the best person on paper. Um, you tend to find and hire people that are great people, but you connect with them. And th there's a reason why they want the job more than just wanting a job. And I think that I've learned this now at this point in my career after having uh, an early retired twice now, and I'll go into that story, that nothing's more powerful than living a life of purpose. And that's what I want to encourage you about. W what I will tell you is from my perspective, when it comes to banking, this is a quote I've said to all of my teams over the years, and it just so happens that my nonprofit's also called The Noble. The most noble profession in banking is fighting fraud and financial crimes. And I'll talk to you a little bit about why I believe that. But a lot of that is the baseline of my purpose and why I do what I do, why I spend way too ma many hours in the course of my days and weeks and years. So this is me. This is me about seven years ago. Um, I was the head of fraud for a bank called Fifth Third Bank. I was there for five years, led a transformation journey around their digital banking. I had all their corporate security and all their components of fraud and security reporting up into me. Again, fantastic career. But I basically wore all the tread off my tires is the way I like to say it. And I, I was done. I moved to the mountains of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, again, I've lived everywhere and I just fell in love with this great city here. But when I moved, I was done with the financial services industry. I was done with fighting financial crime. I became this guy. I became more focused on, um, I don't know, music. And I wrote a couple of books, just anything other than financial services. But then I met somebody through a mutual friend that worked for the United Nations fighting human trafficking. And in that one conversation, I went from not wanting anything to do with financial services to feeling compelled to do something. And this was about seven years ago. In a three-week period, I just went out and I got offered to be the head of fraud and security for several large global financial institutions. And I realized that there was something more for me to do. And this is where I started my nonprofit that basically equips and unites the financial services industry with law enforcement, with other nonprofit groups to fight human crime, as we call it. But I also went to work for PwC, Price Waterhouse, where I led their fraud practice for about three years. And what I would tell you is one of the conversations I had with them as even in, in the recruiting process is they knew what I could do based on my resume and who I was and who I knew, but they really were intrigued by this whole idea that I wanted to do all this different and fight financial crime or human crime differently. I will tell you the platform of purpose and the platform of, of, of finding a reason to work, to show up every day is absolutely critical to sustain a career, to differentiate yourself and to make a mark on humanity. What we call here as part of the noble human crime. Human crime is made up of four things, human trafficking, uh, scams, 
child exploitation and elder abuse. Um, these are horrific and atrocious crimes that happen. Behind every transaction in the financial services industry is a human being. I know you've all have credit cards. You've all experienced, I'm sure, transactional fraud in your career. What I would tell you is we don't realize in the world that behind these transactions are people being bought and sold. Even dollar transactions in the middle of the night are actually people that are being purchased for or forced labor. There's a ton of really terrible things that happen in the world, but there's a ton of ways to actually impact that, pick that, impact that and weave that into your career. Financial crime risk also is going up in the industry. And I'm giving you some baseline information here. Scams are at an all-time high. Fraud is at an all-time high. You start looking at the types of um, money-muling account that's going on across the industry right now. Because coming through COVID, we've actually gone, to the, we've gone through the digital acceleration process. And so have the criminals. And I'm sure you're all seeing the, the, the ramifications and the outputs of this. The other issue we have in the industry is that basically there are fraudsters, there are criminals that are consolidating financial crimes in and through our banking system and creating what's called mule accounts. They're doing this through cyber risks. They're doing this through brick and mortar, call center, all these areas. They're using these funds to create, to, to commit illicit activities. So why did I tell you all this stuff? Well, one, I'd love to let you know that there are hundreds of thousands of financial crime fighters across the world at banks all over the world that are fighting every day, showing up fighting fraud, anti-money, fighting money laundering, fighting cyber-enabled fraud, cybersecurity. These are very meaningful careers. And I know what you focused on is just that. The application of where you can take your cyber experience and your, and your skills, your analytic skills and such, you can apply that to many different fields. I do want to say that in the financial services world, we need help. We need great people to come in with passion that want to make a difference and not just earn a paycheck. I'm going to tell you, I've had a wonderful career, like I said, where, where I've been blessed to earn a lot of money and learn, fly around the country, around the world. And, and I realized that at some point you realize that you can only buy so many cars and so many houses. And at the other end of it is just yourself and your family. And that's it. At this point of where you are, as you're coming out of your degree program, I just encourage you to chase purpose and passion as much as anything else. When you examine what type of organization you can join, when you, when you try to understand how you can apply the skills you've learned to make a difference, I'm talking to and, and I interact on a regular basis with the heads of the Secret Service and the IRS Investigations Unit and other branches of HSI and law enforcement. I'm talking to them as they're leaving the public sector after they've lived a life of purpose serving our country. I get to talk to them about how they can apply that in the banking sector, for example, to do the same. That's my encouragement for you. Live a life of purpose. Definitely think about exploring financial services as a wonderful application to that. I go back to some of the stuff Rex said. You know, you, you, have, you have a resume that you've built through your career prior to, school, prior to school, to what you've done and accomplished through your schooling and training and certifications. Um, but I think that really it's time to understand that um, I think employers are not just looking for talent, but they're looking for great people. And there are some organizations, and I get to deal with these all the time, and even, even government organizations. And, and for those that are interested in serving on the government side, they're in need of your skill set also. I, I have that conversation all the time. But when I talk to my friends that lead security departments and fraud departments and financial crime departments at the largest financial institutions in North America, if not the world, um, we're looking for great people. There's a shortage but we're looking for people that we can partner with that would be mission focused, that are coming in and that can apply their skill, want to earn an amazing compensation and salary to do a really fun job. Our, our job changes all the time. Just when you think you've plugged a hole, the financial crime or the criminal is, has found another one. But we're looking for people that honestly are mission focused and purpose driven. And I think there's a lot of opportunity in this field with what you're, what you're coming back from, which, what you're certified in, to apply it to just that at all of the different insurance industries and other types of telecommunications, all types of organizations. So what I wanted to do to end this as I've stopped sharing my screen is I want to reinforce and encourage you in a different way. Um, you know, as, as was said, is, is music is an important part of my life. Um, one of the things that I've learned in my career is to bring all of myself um, in my complete self, any, any situation I'm in, um, as an executive at a bank, 
um, as a as a consultant. Um, I find that when I bring my authentic Ian, my full self, my hobbies, my my passions, and my skills to the table, it makes for meaningful conversations and interviews and discussions. And candidly, um, it's really helped on the sales side of of a lot of the work that I've done on the consulting end. So one of the th ways that I myself is this guitar, and I'm gonna, I didn't ask for permission, Steve, but I'm gonna sing a song called Old Dirt Road. And Old Dirt Road, I wrote it about seven years ago. And I don't know how, if you, Old Dirt Road, I seven years ago, and it was, it was about when I moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I gave up the world of my executive position at, in a banking. And I realized that I could live a life of purpose and reinvent myself. And so if I could cede anything to you in this, and I'm landing the plane here, Steve, I know we got to go to a great, Gerald is going to be a great um, speaker. I looked at his bio and everything. I, I'm looking forward to hearing him myself. I want to encourage you and let you realize that you can make the world a better place. You can make a difference in your day job, be very successful and be yourself. I moved to the mountain three years ago. And I was all done with the man I used to know. All washed up, I had done my time. Paid my dues, made it out just fine. But this is a song about a man that could rise from the ashes, still do some good. Find a new passion down the old dead road. Make a new life, a life worth living. But this is a song about a man that could rise from the ashes, still do some good. Find a new passion down the old dead road. Make a new life. Steve, I got to say, I'm thanking you very much for my opportunity to speak to you guys. And I just encourage all of you to get trained up. You have a lot you can offer to this world. We need all of you involved. There's a great career ahead. Talk to us about financial services. Reach out to me. Live a life of purpose above everything else. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate the time. Thank you, my friend, Ian. Uh, by the way, we will make sure that everyone who is speaking will uh, be available in terms of uh, phone number, contact information, et cetera. Please, I encourage you to reach out to them. Now, I will join Ian and others in being excited to uh, meet Dr. Auger. I've heard a lot about you, sir. I've looked a little bit myself at your background, and I'm ready to learn. So you've got the mic, young man. Uh, sorry, we, I, we can't hear you. Of course. How's that? Is that, is that work a bit better? Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Gerald Dozier. Um, thank you for having me. I've been, just as a quick bio, this isn't extensively what I will be talking about, but um, I've been working in information security for about 17 years. I uh, came up on the GRC side and I do a little bit of blue. I run my own information security program now for a mid-size um, uh, manufacturing company that's global. Uh, and that's been really, really satisfying. Uh, so, and I, and I, you know, also went through kind of a, a traditional academic path, um, you know, with computer science and then uh, focusing in on information security. But what I wanted to talk to you all about today is in, in my, um, in my humble opinion, you know, getting, getting education, getting practical skills, getting certifications are all you know, very, very important. And they make you capable of delivering on your abilities. But it, the reality is um, getting a job, finding a job, um, like 50% of the time, it's through a network. It's through your professional or personal network. And it's not because, um, you know, people who you don't know aren't more qualified for the job or whatever. The reality is for me, like, for me, right? I, I run my own program. If I need to fill a position, if I need a GRC analyst, if I need a SecOps analyst, I need one now, right? So the fastest way for me to get one is if if I already know one, then I can I can fast track it and be like, are you, you know, like, do you want this job? Can you do this job? Yes, yes, let's go. Boom, right? So what I want to talk to you today about is how you can network um, a bit and, you know, do a couple like best practice type things, um, that I think you will find has significant value. All right. So I'm going to give you a ton of examples too. Let me switch my screen here. Okay. So first thing we're going to do guys, I want to give you like a couple, just basic pro tips that you want to do with your LinkedIn profile. Okay. So this is my profile right here. 
If you don't have a LinkedIn profile, that's the very first thing that you should go do is create a LinkedIn profile. Yes, it's like a Microsoft social media thing, but the reality is it, it's basically like Facebook for business. It's it's professional. When people when you apply for a job or when you're networking with other people, not only will they uh, connect with you on LinkedIn in order so it's easy to remember who you are. Like, oh, I talked to that person six months ago. I think they worked at uh, General Motors. Boom, pull it up on LinkedIn and there you go, right? So it's it's kind of like a... Um, it's it's kind of like your public face, if you will. So just a couple quick practices. One, uh, this this header banner right here is configurable. It comes initially, it comes off as default, and it's wicked boring. There's a website called Canva, C A N V A. By the way, I plan on giving you like a ton of like takeaway action items. So I don't know if this is being recorded uh, or just jot some things down or connect with me after, and I'll tell you all this again if you want. Um, go to Canva, right? Right here on the on the on the first thing, LinkedIn banner, no big deal. Right? They have like a million different ones. You don't have to be artistic or invent the wheel here. Boom. Right? You just there you go. No big deal. Uh here, you know, here's one. This one's free. You just click in, change your name, you know, Jerry Osier, right? Change like, I don't know, aspiring cyber security. Guys, you get you get the idea, right? Boom. And now I got like a pretty decent look in hot um, uh, banner here and I could just push this. You can't even see it, but there's a publish to LinkedIn button, right? Uh, or you can download it, right? Or you can see it. Okay, so that's the first thing. So within about 30 seconds, you guys got a dynamite uh, header image up here. If you wanna add text, you can do that on LinkedIn. Also professional photo. Again, this is your public facing face <laughs> for lack of a better term. So like if it's a picture that you like carved out, like it's like you and three friends who are like at the bar, like arms around each other, drinking your hand, like it's all out of focus. Like your eyes have those red dots in them. Like that's probably not the, what, like what you would want to put on your resume if you're handing it to a potential employer, right? So I recommend you either, you know, we all have great phone cameras now or, or many people have phone cameras. Uh, that have great cameras, you could just take a picture and you know change the lighting, whatever, put on uh, a nice shirt, and there you go, you got a picture. The other thing I want to point out is, um, you know, these other things are a little bit more uh, novel or whatever, but right here, this section right here will default. If you are like an information security analyst at, you know, Navy Federal, that's what it's going to say here by default. I encourage you to modify that to be kind of a uh, like a statement of your ability to deliver, like whatever it is that you want to do. If you want to go be a SOC analyst, then say something in here like, uh, like driven to secure uh, enterprise operations through SOC capabilities or something like that. Say something that sells you, say something that delivers what the impact is that you would bring to an organization, right? And, and, and that's huge. One other thing on LinkedIn before I jump off this, I want to point out, this featured section down here, they just added this a few months ago. This featured section is basically like putting pins in it. Like this will always be here, right? So I wrote a book called Cybersecurity Career Master Plan. It's like a, it's like a, a complete guide on how to build a career in information security, right? I want people to know that I wrote that book. So I pin it right here. I also have this Simply Cyber YouTube channel that helps thousands of people, right? Hold on, I'm getting all sorts of messages, people. Um, I want people to know about that, so I pin it right here. So what? Am, why am I telling you this? So listen, if you do a blog, right, or you have a GitHub repository, or you're doing something that's tied in to how awesome you are at crushing cybersecurity, or you know, uh, some type of philanthropic or extracurricular community service type thing, something that you're proud of, something that you know to fit like makes you have depth of character, put it there and pin it on that featured section. I'm telling you, people go to LinkedIn to basically like creep on potential candidates to say like, who is this person? Let me get some more information, right? Because your resume is just one page and doesn't really do a great job of conveying who you are. So I strongly encourage you to take advantage of that. Now, the next thing that I wanted to share with you guys, and this is probably like my power tip to take away is um, Discord. Now, if you don't know what Discord is, just briefly, if you're <laughs> if you're Gen X like me, it's kind of like uh, GeoCities or AOL uh, Instant Messenger back in the day, except like on uh, 
like really on steroids. If you're more of like uh, a millennial, uh, then it's, it's kind of like Slack, I guess, maybe. But basically, Discord is this, um, this community-driven uh, chat server thing. And all these ones on the left are different Discord servers, right? So this is Simply Cyber. This is my Discord server, for example. And in those servers, there are channels, right? And I'm telling you right now, all there's tons of cybersecurity ones, right? Like most of these ones on my side right here are all cybersecurity ones. They're free to join. And most of them have job hunting channels in them. Like I have an entire section for helping people find jobs in general, but like, but there's job hunting sections here. So you can join these servers for free and start networking and you'll find out about jobs. This one is an entire server for jobs, right? For international jobs, right? So these are North American ones, South America, it depends like what continent you wanna go work in, but they're all information security, right? Another one right here, just really quick. This is um, Jason Blanchard out of Black Hills Information Security. He is on a mission to like place like hundreds of people into jobs. This is a job board. These are all open positions, all of them, right? So I'm telling you about Discord for two reasons. One, you can join Discord and you just get access to these jobs. It's way better. They're, they're, they're curated, tailored. The person who posts it, you can ask them a question. It's not like this kind of, dice.com listing or LinkedIn job posts where like, you're just up, like, trust me, if you've already been applying to jobs and you're just throwing your resume into the void and you're not getting responses or you're getting ghosted, it, it sucks. Like it's frustrating. And I feel you, these type of services exist because security practitioners want to help other security practitioners. So definitely get in. Now that's just, listen, that discord server I just told you all about, these are just for the job stuff. The other thing I want to point out is, and again, networking is going to give you a significant advantage over getting a job, is joining some of these servers, okay? Now, you might not be a extrovert, right? You might be, you might be an introvert and you're not feeling comfortable, but listen, you can join the server and you can just lurk. And by I say this server, it could be any Discord server, okay? I'm not saying join mine. You can if you want, but I'm just saying any of them. This is like Discord. Right now, Discord is where security practitioners are congregating, sharing ideas, expressing you know, interest, discussing topics and stuff like that. You can creep if you want to be introverted. You can, be, you can then start chiming in, right? You can get up to speed on what's going on. And most importantly, you will start meeting people. A community will start to form. You will become part of that community. And I'm telling you, you'll start sharing like what your story is, what you're good at, what you're looking for. And eventually, um, you know, people are going to be like, oh, that's cool. Let me, let me, uh, you know, I know, uh, Abby's looking for a job in, uh, in the financial services district or financial services and, uh, wants to be an entry-level incident response person. And I just found out about this job because a lot of jobs aren't posted, right? This is how it works. Now, besides just lurking and besides just chatting and commenting and stuff like that, I, I encourage you to contribute contributing is definitely a way for you to give to the community. And, and I, I can't explain it. It's beyond my comprehension, but there is a, there is an ecosystem of sorts that goes on. And when you're contributing and giving into the community, the community gives back to you now. So I want you to think of ways that you might be able to contribute. And I want to give you a couple ex ex specific examples. Okay. You guys might, you see this coding 101 right here? Hopefully this, I'm seeing it backwards. So hopefully you guys aren't seeing it backwards, but um, this coding 101 here, I actually, can I ask, Is Steve, is my display showing correctly or is my display showing backwards? Your display is perfect for us. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, thank you. So see this coding 101, right? There's a guy in my server who said, hey, Jerry, um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a student of cybersecurity. I'm going into my senior year. I, I, I've gotten all the cyber skills, but I haven't learned how to program yet. Um, I really think it, need, it would be important if I learned. Can I create a channel on your server called Coding 101 and I'll post one challenge a day uh, and I'll solve it. It's like a simple Python challenge. They've gotten a little bit more complicated, but I'll do one a day and it'll hold myself accountable and it'll help me learn. And if anyone else wants to get in on it, that's fine. So he did that. He's been doing it for probably six months. Okay. After like maybe three or four weeks, someone jumped in there and answered one of the things and started a conversation. And now there's dozens of people in there every day. And it's like, it's like bubbled into its own little 
subgroup of this group of people, right? So he's providing value. He's also developing himself and he's networking and making connections. In fact, I, I, I just realized this too. Like um, I was in a training last week, okay? Um, with Black Hills Information Security. And I was doing a training on active defense and cyber deception. And we were using open source tools. And the instructor, John Strand said, man, like this tool really needs to be updated. I wish I had an intern or something who could update this. I just don't have time. And he just, you know, went on or whatever. So I spoke with him after the class. I said, hey, you know what? I actually know a guy who's like, really sharp and been working on Python for a while and is really focused and he's a student, uh, I think he might have time. So I asked Pete, the guy who created Coding 101, Pete said, that sounds awesome. I talked to John. John said, that sounds awesome. Connected. And I know for a fact, Black Hills likes to hire people that have worked with them and they know about in their network. So I'm not saying that he's guaranteed to get a job in any way, but because he reached out to me, because he started this coding one one because he started contributing and developing uh, this community, you know, when the situation came up six months down the road, he was the very first third person I thought of. It wasn't even a question. He literally popped into my mind. And I said, that can help Black Hills. So this is such a really uh, great opportunity. Um, even myself, uh, frankly, right? So uh, there's a U.S. cyber games um, uh, I guess I don't have the Discord right at my hand, but anyways, there is a U.S. cyber team, right? It competes internationally, kind of like the Olympics, um, and I won't get into all the details of that, but because of Simply Cyber and because of what I've been doing with Simply Cyber in the community, the chairman of the U.S. Cyber Games Committee reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to be involved with them and be, be involved in some of their activities and stuff like that, and I said, absolutely, and there's no way if I hadn't been doing all this other stuff that they would have known to contact me, right? I could have been the perfect person for the job that they wanted, but if they didn't know who I was, they would never have thought to call me. So networking, networking, networking is so important. And then just, just one other story, just to kind of drive home the point of why it's so important to network. That book I wrote, I met a woman who helped author the book with me named Jack Scott. She was introduced to me by a mutual friend. So I say, Jax, let's write this book. So we're writing the book. What do you do? She's special forces in the army and she's a chief, uh, cyber, uh, cyber threat intelligence expert. Like she's like the leader in cyber threat intelligence. I was on a private chat. Like, you know, we all have these group chats, right? I'm in a private group chat with a, 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 some other people who are like me, like, uh, you know, people who run their own security programs and stuff. And they said, hey, uh, we just got this funding, big, big dump of money from the investors. We need to stand up a threat intelligence capability. I'm looking for a seasoned senior cyber threat intel person who can just run with it and go. And Jax had just told me the week before that she was looking for a job. She was going to transition out of her, her military role and get into the private sector. Did I know anything? And within a week, I found out that job and she got hired into it three days later. So these things happen all the time. The one thing I would caution you on, though, and, and I really would caution you because it's I know if you've got bills to pay, it can be hard. You want the job, want the job. D do not go into these type of communities like with where's the job? Give me the job. I need the job. Or like, hey, I did these three things. Where's my job? Like it, it very much is a community. I don't know how to explain it. And, and the, the worst thing is I can't tell you if you go into these discord servers and you become part of the communities and you. It, it's not like within four days you'll get a job or within six weeks you'll get a job. It could, it could, it could be instant. It could be six months. I, I don't know, but I just know that your opportunities and your probabilities of landing op uh, jobs and, and finding out about them and getting interviews and stuff like that will go up significantly if you do like these, these discord type things and, and get involved with the community. The final thing I wanted to share, and this, this is more of a shameless plug than anything. By the way, if you want to join my Discord server, you can go to that site right there. It'll take you right into it. If you're looking to like, you know, dabble your toes in the Discord server space that I've been spitting about here for a minute. The other thing that I wanted to really, really encourage you if you're not already doing it, again, getting education, getting certs, getting hands-on keyboard skill, all very, very valuable. I guarantee you when you're going to get interviewed, you will get asked this question. Regardless, I don't care if you're getting a SOC analyst, a pen tester, um, you know, GRC uh, analyst, engineer, whatever. How do you stay current with cybersecurity? 
That's going to be a question. I guarantee you. Now, there are great ways to do it. And the reason that you need to stay current is because the industry is constantly changing. Technology is constantly changing. And threat actors are always changing because as soon as we, as soon as we stand up another fence, they just find a way around that fence. Or as soon as we stand up something, they come, they come up with a new technique to go over it. So you got to stay current. There's a bunch of different ways. One, I, I'll just tell you, like you can, um, SANS has an internet stormcast. So if you Google that, it'll come up. That's more of a technical one. So if you fancy yourself a technical person or an engineer, you want to get like into the wires and stuff, look at the SANS uh, internet stormcast. SISOseries.com. They also do a wonderful job every day with a podcast that you can subscribe to. Uh, Recorded Future um, has an email that you can sign up for. Like, you know, you basically get put on an email blast, but like they do send a daily threat intelligence email. These are all great ways for you to stay informed right now. Of course, I would love to promote one thing too. I also do, if you go to this site every single morning, because I am in love with cybersecurity every single morning, I do a, I lead a threat intelligence briefing. It's uh, 8 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Eastern Standard Time, and then 10 o'clock Tuesday and Thursday because I teach Tuesdays and Thursday mornings. But anyways, I lead a cybersecurity threat briefing. We go, you know, there's probably 100 people in there, go through the stories, give analysis and perspective on what you should be taking out of those stories. And, you know, people have, have already expressed, we've been doing it for a couple months. People express, yeah, like I get asked that, um, in interviews and it's been super helpful. So, um, whether you come over to simply cyber or not, that's not really important. What's important is that you engage with these communities, whether it's on LinkedIn or discord server, cause that's where a lot of the sec people are at and stay informed on current events. Right now there's like, there's an, uh, uh, the Chinese Olympics, they're forcing, uh, athletes to use an app that's been proven to be vulnerable and, and doing all sorts of weird stuff. Uh, Ukraine, Russia, tensions going on, cyber attacks going on in there. President Biden and his executive order around zero trust architecture and having a plan in 60 days. Uh, That just happened today. So like all of these things you may not fully get, but it's important to understand that they're going on. So that's about my time. I don't know if we want to, if there's Q&A or if I just get pushed to the back, I'm fine with whatever. If anyone wants to connect with me, please do so. I really love helping people. Oh, Dr. Roger, thank you so much for, for your time today. We really appreciate having you. Um, I've been following you on LinkedIn myself for a few months. Um, so I'd encourage you all to definitely uh, follow and check it out. Um, I know you do some live stuff too, as well as Simply Cyber. Um, I think uh, the uh, Discord, I one of the um, uh, students in here already posted your Discord link, which is really great. Um, oh, could thank you. you. Could you yeah. pull up the um, uh, daily threat briefing one really quickly? Yeah, sure. Uh, if, you, if that's not too bad. There we go. Awesome. We had a few questions about that. Um, I don't, unfortunately, we don't have uh, too much time. Uh, we've got employers uh, speaking in breakout sessions at seven. Um, oh, perfect. Yeah. For the next about hour. Thank you so much again for 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 speaking with us today. Um, this is really good information for for all of these students because our program is made of um, you know people that are either in cyber or want to get into it. Um, and our program is kind of uh, hopefully that avenue to to fast track their way into it. Um, so this stuff is really great. Um, thank you again so much for your time. Um, do I? I think I still have you pinned. Maybe not. Well, I'll, I'll jump off all the same, but I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your time today. It was wonderful talking with you, and I hope you all have a good one. Take care. Thanks. Likewise. Well, thank you all so much. This has been an awesome hour so far. I hope you've been enjoying um, our, our speakers. I just want to go through 30 seconds or less real quick. We're about two minutes over. Um, there are breakout sessions that are already open. So the way this is really going to work for the next hour and a half or so is if at the bottom of your screen, when you click on breakout sessions, it'll show the names of the organizations, whether a company or um, or organization that is doing a talk. And each talk is going to be going for about 30 minutes. Um, and if you see at the bottom of your screen, each breakout session, there's one that Cisco, it starts with Cisco, another one that starts with TVA, another that starts with DICE. Um, and then you also see there's two networking and coffee rooms. And those are really, I mean, treat this, this is kind of an odd time, this coronavirus slash remote virtual program that we run. Um, but, you know, I encourage you to still keep this kind of as much of a job fair as you can. I mean, if you do, if you're talking with an employer and you want to, if they have time afterwards and you can send them a message, maybe you can go there. Um, or if you just have another 
another student or you want to take a break, just feel free to pop into that. I put two open uh, just so uh, it wouldn't be too congested if anybody wants to use those. Um, but again, if you're a employer um, or a foundation that will be talking today, uh, you feel free to go ahead and hop over to that breakout room now. Uh, there'll be a program manager from uh, the CWCT program, either Stephen, Rex, or Chrissy. Stephen and Rex, you've heard before, and Chrissy is another one of our great program managers. They'll help to moderate, and they'll be recording those sessions as well. I'll be popping around to help, um, but otherwise, you all are free to go to the breakout session of your choice, and I hope you get as much knowledge as you can and information from our uh, lovely partners. Nice. Yep. Okay. You then moved to Huntsville. Then I moved to then I moved to Chattanooga about ten, a little bit over ten years ago, and I now live in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, experience. So these are all the things that I've done, plus many, many more that I just didn't think about when I was putting the slide together. Uh, red teaming, penetration testing, vulnerability assessments. I've done the the governance, risk, and compliance work. Um, incident response. I was the incident response manager at TVA for about seven years. Um, I've done forensics, malware analysis, you, you name it, I've done it. Um, and it, cyber is so broad, and I tell this to everyone, you can find your niche, find what you love to do, and go after it. Me, to this day, forensics, malware analysis, and incident response is still my passion. I don't do it today. Um, I've got teams that do lots of the things that, that I have listed here today, but find that, find that thing that really excites you and learn all about it. And you can still stay in cyber and pivot over and do something different. If you get bored, that's, that's you know, one of the things that I love about this career is there's so many different things to do that if you get bored, then, then there's an issue there. Okay, so let me talk to you about TVA just a little bit. This is our motto, serving the people of the valley. Nice little collage there of different things that um, are about TDA, what we're about, the, the river, uh, a lot of fun things to do. We're a power company. We're very interesting, and I'll talk about that from that perspective of, of why we're so interesting and unique. Um, our mission, energy, environment, and economic development. Uh, we are a power company. We generate and sell power. If you are in the TDA footprint and you'll see that, even though you may buy your power from your local power company, we're the ones who make it and get it transmitted over to those local power companies to your house so that we're all online like we are today. Environment, that's a big thing too. Uh, you'll see a slide coming up here on how our generation footprint is changing. Uh, it's evolved and where we're going and I won't spend a whole lot of time on that. And but then economic development too. We want people to come to the Tennessee Valley. We want jobs to be created. That's a metric that we track at the TBA level. How many jobs did we create or help support? Um, what kind of energy incentives can we help local governments, you know, provide to those companies who are wanting to come in? And we've seen a, a number. I, I get these, they call them code blues inside TBA. And I get one probably two or three times a week of companies that are growing, that are moving to the valley. Uh, it's just a very worker friendly, company friendly place to be. Okay, at a glance, we are a wholly, go, wholly owned government corporation founded in 1933 under the TVA Act. We are the nation's largest public power company. We've got more than 10 million people across seven states, 80,000 mile service area, lots of miles of transmission lines, um, and our generation capacity is 37,000 megawatts, which is a lot of power. Here is that map that I talked about. So when you think of TVA and you hear Tennessee Valley, then you probably are thinking, well, that's just Tennessee. In fact, 51% uh, of our service territory is outside the state of Tennessee. So if you see that blue area is the state of Tennessee, we've got 49% of our, of our 100 is Tennessee. But when you start looking up at Kentucky, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, we've got some territory in North Carolina, we've got some territory in Virginia. So TVA is not just Tennessee. It is the Tennessee Valley, which is that river system that runs through Tennessee, down into Alabama and other states. Critical infrastructure. So TVA is involved in nine different critical infrastructure sectors. We're, we're a unique company because we are a government entity that's also a power company. So when you start hearing of attackers and people who um, may want to cause harm because of a government affiliation. Well, we check that box. 
if you hear of attackers or nation states that may want to cause harm because of your role in critical infrastructure, well, we check that box too. We check that box nine different times and uh, which puts a pretty good target on us. So it's, it's a lively uh, organization that we're involved with. So I won't read through every one of those, but it's, it's just interesting when you, when we think of government and our government peers, our partners in the, in the federal space, not everybody has, nine critical infrastructure sectors. Not everybody has nuclear plants. Not everyone has uh, pump storage, um, which is a pretty cool, interesting um, way to generate power. Not everyone ha has 16,000 miles of transmission lines. So we're very unique in that case. Okay, I talked about this earlier. Here's how we've changed and where we're going. And this has actually changed. The FY30 stuff has changed. Basically, this is how we generate the power. Coal, nuclear, hydro, and gas. Those were the four ways that we did it back in 2007. 2020, we've added um, wind and solar. We've added additional, um, we, we've reduced significantly our dependence on coal. Uh, coal is dirty, coal is expensive. Uh, just cleaning it to, to the best of the technology that we have available today is very expensive. So we, we're looking at that clean energy. We Everybody wants clean energy. So. That's where we're moving and continuing to move. One of, the, one of the few negative things about the Tennessee Valley is, well, we don't have a whole lot of wind. So there's not, you know, we can't set up um, windmills. We can't set up turbines there on, on a beach and just capture all that wind coming in off the ocean. So uh, there's just not a lot of that for us. Solar is definitely gaining speed, gaining steam. We'll continue to deploy more, coal, more, more solar. But uh, this is a, just a, quick view of how we generate the power from and how it's changed over the last 10 years, where we're going over the next 10 years. All right, now we're going to get to the good stuff, uh, where we're going to talk about cybersecurity specifically. Um, interesting company again. So not only are we, you know, federal, but there's not a lot of federal jobs out there that get to or have to, depending on your perspective, deal with IT, traditional IT, and what we call as OT, that operational technology systems, that those systems that generate that in industrial control systems, the SCADA, which is security control and data acquisition. So um, we're unique in that we deal on both sides of the house. So TDA cybersecurity doesn't just look at the IT system, those data centers, file servers, things that are you would typically see in almost any company but we also look at the generation plants, the transmission networks, the control centers, the substations, all within the purview of what we do at TDA. Here's our organization. So that uh, emblem up there in the top right corner is actually our coin that we give out. So if you've been affiliated with the government, coins are big. We designed this one several years ago. I, I really like it. I was involved with it. So I, I try to take every chance I can to, to post it and postage stamp it wherever I can get it. But this is our organization. Um, our chief information security officer is a vice president. Uh, her name is Andrea Brackett. She's been with TVA many, many, many years. She started right out of high school. She went to Tennessee Tech in Middle Tennessee, started with TVA right out of college and has worked her way up through the organization to where now she's a vice president. Um, four main pillars to TVA cybersecurity. I'll talk just a little bit about each one of those and what we do. And uh, certainly during the question and answer period, I, that's coming up at the end. If you've got questions specifically, then please don't hesitate to, to ask. Privacy program, we, we got federal privacy laws that we have to follow. So that's protecting that personally identifiable information, social security numbers, addresses, just you know, protecting, making sure we're protecting the, the information that people have entrusted us with. Engagement, that's the team that I lead. Um, so I've got two different branches under me. I actually have a few more little one-offs, but main focus for my teams, authorization and outreach, that's that governance arm of TVA cybersecurity. That is making sure that people are following the rules that apply to us because we're federal, getting them through that authorization process. You may have, you may have heard that term ATO, which that's operation, authority to operate. Uh, but it's making sure that we're following all the rules that are required there. We also operate a phishing program. So we do monthly phishing exercises to the TVA population to see how are we doing? 
What's, what's that percentage of people who click the link? What's the people who report it to us? So we've got two pieces to that. You report it, yes, click it, no. And we track all of those things. Um, local power company engagements. So that team also works with all the power companies. There's over 150 customers for TVA. So it's working with them to make them aware of what's going on in cyber. Many of these companies are in very small, very small co-op or municipality that has one person that is their um, computer guy for if their printer's not working. That is the lady that they call when they've got a new employee and needs a new computer. That also does cyber, that also does this, that, and 10 other things. So it's working with them to help them understand that some things that they may not have time to look up on their own. Assessments and testing, that's another team under me. We operate our vulnerability disclosure program. So VDP, that's the acronym there, is a mandate from the federal government that you have to have a way for people to report vulnerabilities on your externally facing website. So we operate that program. If, if or when vulnerabilities are reported to us, we work back with system owners, the technical people who know that system to get those vulnerabilities mitigated, whatever the case may be. If it's a patch, get the patch installed. If it's something bigger, then we need to figure out how we're gonna mitigate that, that risk that we found or identify through that uh, public VDP. That team also does our penetration testing. Uh, we do work with our incident response team where we're testing our sensors that we have deployed where we will run threat simulation activities where we will use the same tools that attackers will use to see if our incident response team is able to detect it. If they are, that's great. If they're not, then we work back with them and say, here's what we did, here's the tool that we did, here's some indicators that you may want to tweak or implement on your side so that you are able to detect it if it's really a bad person that comes that's coming in. Strategy and risk management is another team uh, within cybersecurity that they're helping with that. If you're familiar with that governance, risk and compliance piece, they're really focused on that risk piece. What are the risk, risks to TVA? How do we get those addressed? And what do we need to do to fix them? Do we need to spin up new projects? Do we need to go buy new technology? Do we need to um, how do we react to new federal mandates that are coming out? So that's the, that's really a generic way of talking about what they do. They've got a ton of things that they do. Uh, and then finally, operations. Incident response, they're the people that are watching the network to make sure that if, if there's something going on, they're able to respond very quickly, um, reduce the damage, and get that system back up online. We call this systems and services. Systems and services is really the, system, the team that operates our sensors. So if we need to deploy something new, if we need to tweak the signatures that we have, if we need to take indicators from our threat intelligence program and get those in there. So if we get something from some of our partners that says, hey, if you see any traffic from 1.1.1.1 and using this protocol, it's definitely bad. You, you know for sure that it's bad. So that systems and services team can take those inputs and put a, a rule in, block it, depending on what that indicator is, so that incident response team gets alerted as soon as that happens. So that's, that's a real quick overview of our organization and, and how we're laid out. I'm not going to go with it through this. We're different because we're federal and we're in the energy sector. There are so many things and regulations that apply to us because of that. If you're a power company that's not federal, you're going to have a subset of this. You're going to have NERC. If you've got nuclear, you're going to have NRC. If you're a public utility, you're going to have SOX. If you're a federal entity, then you're going to have FISMA and the Government Act. We're unique in that all of that stuff applies. And everybody believes that they're the most important, which if you're being audited by that group, they absolutely are the most important at that time. Okay, let's talk about cyber organization. Here on the left, you'll see this is sort of how we're lined up. Analysts and, the, and those things that are in parentheses are the um, experience that we're looking for. Analysts one to three years, analysts two, three plus, specialist, senior specialist, program manager, senior. We, 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 we're very creative in that we just add senior to these things and it makes it the next level. Um, after manager, there's senior manager. After senior manager, there's director. We don't have a senior director, but so that's, that's pretty much as high as it goes there unless you go to the VP ever. But let me talk to you about certifications. This is just a sample of what we have and what we're looking for from people. Certifications 
it's a double-edged sword. And I'll, I'll be real with you. I've known people who have tremendous amount of certifications and they couldn't punch their way out of wet paper bags. They just, they're really good test takers. They, they remember it long enough to take that certification exam and then their brain dumps and they show up day one and they just, they, they don't remember a single thing that they did. So, but it's a way to validate as of day X, you knew enough to get your certification. But we look at these and we spend time with our employees, helping them to develop. Starting in this fiscal year, so what we, because we're government, we go October to October the 1st to September 30th, but starting October 1st this year, we are allowing all of our employees 160 hours to go and either go, go to training, to do some investigation on something that's just interesting to, to them, something that, you know, even though they may be on the pen test team, they're really interested in incident response. They want to, you know, do more work around and learn about malware analysis. We're, we're giving them the time. We're putting our money where our mouth is because guess what? When they're not in that seat working, when I'm not in my seat working, there's something that's not getting done. So we recognize the importance of giving people time to, to learn, to train, and to pursue their passions. And that's what we do. Um, we've really always done it, but this year we formalized the plan. Okay, so this chart looks familiar. There's my coin again. I highlighted areas where we have vacancies today. So if you remember what some of the things were that we were talking about, what those teams do, there are vacancies there today. So our organization is 70 plus people that are that all work under Andrea ultimately uh, that's working across the gamut of what we do at TVA. So now let me give you some our hiring process. Um, above analysts, all of our positions require certifications. All of our positions, even at the analyst level, require a degree or experience. So if you if we're looking for if you go back to that um, one to three years. If you've got a degree, you're probably checking the box on that. If you've got a four-year degree, if you've got a three-year degree, or there's no such thing as a three-year degree, but a four-year degree and three years of experience, that's, that's what we're talking about there. Apply, apply, and apply again. Don't get discouraged. Our, the way that we post our jobs is very frustrating to me. I was talking to a manager today who was frustrated because there were two positions out there that looked exactly the same to somebody on the outside. Somebody applied on one thinking they were applying on the incident response team, but it wasn't clear because we use a very similar or almost exactly the same position description posting as, as the manager for the risk team, uh, for the manager of the IR team. So the way that happens is HR will do that qualification screening. But if you see two jobs out there that look exactly the same, there's a very high chance. Well, there's not a high chance. It's, it's two different teams. So apply and the jobs, I'll tell you, I've been doing this a very long time. I don't have all the qualifications for our entry level position. It's, it's huge, it's 30 bullets of things and either I don't have the qualifications or I have no interest in doing that kind of stuff. So don't get discouraged when you look through that and you're like, well, bullet three and bullet four really align with my passion, but the other 20 bullets I have no interest in doing or the other 20 bullets I've never done. Don't get discouraged by that. Apply, apply and apply again. HR then takes all those applicants and they do that screening. If it's a um, program manager position that requires eight years of experience, they're going to look at the resume and they're going to be like, okay, this person doesn't have eight years experience. They don't make the initial cut. Um, if you do, then it goes to the hiring manager. Hiring manager, that's why I say apply, apply and apply again, because the hiring manager has developed those things that they're really interested in. If, you're, if it's an IR manager, it's going to be different than our pen test team. So uh, I want to make sure I get through this real quick so you have time for questions. Hiring manager does the interview, then you do the selection, then it just you have to wait. Uh, they have to do the background checks, they have to do those screens, and then you start. So that's our hiring process. Okay, so I rambled and talked longer than I wanted to, but I wanted to, to give you some energy some insight into what we are, and then give you some time for questions and answers if anybody has any. Nobody? Okay, let me tell you one thing one from, I can't remember the, the, the gentleman's name that was talking. If you're DOD, if you're coming from the DOD, 
people at TBA, people in the outside world of commercial, they don't understand your acronyms. They, they, they don't know what a C2BMC is. They don't want, they don't know what an MDA is. They don't know what mm-hmm. this, that is. Break those acronyms out because I can translate it because I've, I've been there or I know how to look it up or I know somebody to ask, but my boss, she doesn't know what it is. She's never been military. So do yourself a favor, put your, put your best foot forward, break out those acronyms because it's alphabet soup. And we, we, we've got our own alphabet dictionary here too. Hey, sir. Yes. Um, Any other questions? It looks for like Todd? Matthew Walker. Yeah. Oh, Matthew Walker posted a question in the chat. I don't know if you saw that. Todd? Yes. I'm looking at it now. That's okay. One to three years. Yes. So we do. That is our entry level position. So let me tell you how you get into that. That does not, that is not a cyber. We don't say one to three years of cybersecurity experience. It is generic. So number one, we have an internship program. That's, that's great for current students that are, and it's not just for University of Tennessee Chattanooga or UT Knoxville. I've got people at Purdue. I've got interns. I can't even pronounce the name of the school up in the Northeast. We've got interns from all over. So internships, if you're still in school, but that experience part is not just cybersecurity. It is, have you done anything in IT? Have you done anything with technology? Make sure you're taking credit for all that. Is secret clearance required? No, not all of our jobs require secret clearance. Some based on, because we're federal, we have the ability to have top secret clearances but that's few and far between. It's those people who are in, engaged. So if, you, if you've ever had a top secret clearance, you know there's additional letters that come after that. We have people that have all the letters and caveats that go with that too. But by default, um, secret top secret clearance is not something that everybody gets because not everybody needs it. If that day comes and you get it put into a position or you rotate and you're like, hey, I really need this person to come over here, we'll get that clearance going for you. But by default, you don't have to have it. Okay. Uh, the, oh, I'm sorry. I, I got one more there. I have time sure. to answer that one too. Yes. Are, are most of the jobs in person? It appeared online that most were not remote. Is that a false assumption? Tell you what, COVID has <laughs> rocked our world. As you can imagine, uh, we don't have a single person in, in cybersecurity that is working in the office. Uh, everybody is working from their, their homes. We have people in Alabama, Tennessee, um, lots of different cities in between there. So as of right now, today, all of our jobs are remote. The thing that we have been told is we are working with every individual employee to figure out what's best for them. If, if for, you know, if for Todd, I want to be in the office five days a week when we're allowed to go back, hey, have to be in the office five days a week. If Rex wants to be remote five days a week, Rex, you're going to be, in the, you're going to be remote five days a week. So as an agency, and all the things that are changing in the federal government when it t- comes to COVID guidance, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, we're really in that wait and see category. But we, we have this motto inside that is reimagining what we do. We've been forced to. So Todd, real quick, if somebody in this group here wants to um, extend a bit of a conversation with you, can they do that? And how would they do that? Yeah, so I, I'll put my email in the chat real quick. Okay. And I'm not sure where we can, if somebody wants to stay on and talk in person, I don't, I'm not sure where that works or. Well, you, you can leave and then go to the breakout room, a coffee room. Yep. And probably coffee room one. Okay. And then I will uh, do that. if somebody wants to join you later, you certainly can do that. So, so you can leave this meeting, Todd. And thanks for the information, Todd. I knew what TVA stood for. I didn't realize the enormity of the organization. So uh, insightful and uh, appreciate your time and your effort. Thank you very much. Nice talking with you. Okay. So next on our uh, list is um, Chuck Speaks. And I wish I had that name, Chuck, when I was teaching in school. That's uh, really appropriate. But Chuck uh, represents IRTC. So Chuck, I will turn it over to you and you can explain uh, IR, you can explain yourself and IRTC and uh, uh, go at it. So I appreciate it, Chuck. Thanks for uh, doing this. I appreciate the time. Uh, thank you for everybody for being on uh, and uh, what you guys are doing and taking interest in, in our organizations. Um, what 
what you guys are, are doing is, is critical uh, to what we are experiencing out there in the, um, uh, in, in the job market for the folks that we, uh, that we are trying to bring on to our organizations, um, especially in cybersecurity, uh, which is one of the areas that, uh, that, that I manage or whatnot. Um, we, we have a significant lack of qualified individuals. Uh, and, and that's not just across entry, but we see it across entry mids and seniors. Um, Intuitive is a 22 year old, uh, traditionally an aerospace, electrical, me mechanical engineering uh, uh, defense contractor. Uh, we're based in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, we have about 500 folks, uh, a little bit north of that right now. Uh, but like I said, we've been uh, we've been around for 22 years. Um, our, our our initial clients are, are still our clients uh, out at uh, U.S. Army Redstone. Uh, so we like to think that um, when we uh, when we do work for organizations, we do really good work, um, and we tend to hang out and stick around and and uh, really get into the mission. Um, and and like I said, our, our founders were engineers themselves, right? So they they were design engineers with an uh, electrical and mechanical background. Um, and, and what our clients, what our customers are doing, especially uh, in the Army, is uh, managing major weapon systems, right? So uh, think about Army aviation platforms. Uh, think about all the missile systems that, uh, that our, our country's defense uh, units use. Um, and when you're doing that type of work, uh, obviously, uh, it, you, can, you can kind of, I won't say meander, but it's how, how an organization uh, evolves over time, from engineering to program support to software development, software engineering, to cybersecurity. And that's, that is the organic evolution of Intuitive. Uh, we, we do a significant amount of cybersecurity work uh, for uh, the Army, uh, we do it for the Air Force. We have done it for uh, commercial organizations, especially in critical infrastructure. Uh, so we, we have a significant focus, um, especially my team, around developing uh, intellectual property, um, cybersecurity solutions uh, and methodology to do a couple of things, right? To assure that the, the systems that our federal partners, our defense partners are, are given to the warfighter, make sure those are safe, uh, but also making sure that our critical infrastructure, I, we, I just followed the, the gentleman from GDA, uh, make sure that the, the critical infrastructure is, is also safe, uh, resilient, um, from a cybersecurity perspective. So we, we spend an inordinate amount of time uh, working in those areas. We're, we're not a commercial organization per se. So when I say we're doing cyber, we're doing software, we're doing that type of work. We're never going to show up doing this for um, I just said Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, you know, something like that. Uh, we, we do what we do. We do it well. Uh, but we tend to stick in our, uh, in our areas of expertise. And like I said, we grew up doing DOD federal work and um, critical infrastructure is very akin to that type of organization. So uh, those are the types of areas where we especially do cybersecurity efforts. And, and that's where a lot of uh, what my, where my team is focused right now. Um, my personal background, if you're interested, um, I, I didn't grow up doing cybersecurity. I'm not sure cybersecurity was a word when I first got into it. Um, but uh, my background is information systems. Uh, you know, I was a, a DBA doing Oracle development. I worked for Oracle for uh, for ten years, um, traveling all over the place. Um, I felt like I was one of a handful of folks in the Huntsville area that didn't work for or with the government in one form or fashion. And about uh, six years ago, I uh, got into uh, the federal defense uh, side of things, and I've been here ever since and loved every minute. Um, and uh, Intuit has been a great organization to uh, to to do some very very interesting things. Not not really some of the boring stuff that you might hear uh, when you think about um, you know some some federal work can be can be slower than others. Uh, but uh, but our teams do some really really interesting work with some really forward leaning uh, government uh, government customers. And I'll pause and see if we've got questions that have, have come in. Um, so let me ask from, from a moderator's perspective, uh, do, do you want me to do a, 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 a additional overview of the organization or talk about uh, what we're looking for uh, from, from 
um, individuals that, that come to Intuitive. Um, you've got time, Chuck. So uh, okay. I would say both of them. I could have our way. <laughs> Absolutely. I, well, thank you. Uh, I didn't want to step on anybody else's toes from, from a time perspective. Um, you've got, I think, about the uh, till top of the hour. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Um, so can I present? Can I, can I pull a screen up or do you just want me to talk through this? I'm sorry. You should be able to share a screen. All right. Let me share a screen for you guys. I'm going to share my presentation if I can get it working. How about that? And there we go. Look at that technology. It works. Yep. All right. Um, so a, a little bit about who we are. Like I said, uh, we uh, I've covered that part. So from a from a geographic perspective, uh, we we are based in Huntsville. Um, we're doing a, a lot of things right now from a, from a uh, geographic perspective. So. If anybody on the phone wants to go to the beach uh, and do some work, uh, call me. Uh, we have two offices, three now, uh, that have been stood up in, in Florida. Uh, we're working on another one in Orlando, probably another one in Tampa within the next handful of months. Uh, and if you want to go out to Colorado, also call me uh, because we've got one of our executive VPs is out in Colorado right now, uh, establishing our office out in Colorado Springs. So um, beyond that, we have some smaller offices out in Camden, Arkansas, uh, as, as well as um, some other field offices up in the Northeast that have a, a handful of folks. Uh, our predominant location, however, is Huntsville. So I would say probably three quarters of our folks are in and around the Huntsville area. Uh, but from a geographic perspective, we are uh, we're growing really quickly, especially in that Florida area. Um, they've done a fantastic job on the uh, on the uh, Emerald Coast down there, growing uh, growing our Air Force business, it's been a, it's been a really fun thing to watch. Um, so when we uh, and, and this is while we're talking to you guys, so, so when we go into the the, uh, the community, especially from a hospital perspective, but any community that we go into, we really kind of burrow in, uh, get uh, go all in, if you will. And establish uh, relationships with our uh, with our uh, partners in that area. Uh, for instance, uh, in, in Huntsville, obviously we, we have the vast majority of our, our folks in Huntsville, um, but we have a, a strategic partnership with UAH and a presence at their ITC center, which is uh, an innovation place where we can uh, essentially bring together some of the some uh, some of our smart folks, some of UAH's smart people and some uh, commercial partners and kind of get into a space where we can collaborate and bring together different perspectives uh, that we might not get if we just sort of stay in our own little bubble and do our own little thing. Uh, but we have really tried to harness academia a little bit uh, to, to understand uh, different approaches or evolving approaches uh, to different types of things and to bring in um, non-traditional uh, partners in this space into a, into one area where we can collaborate and, and develop the next generation of solutions uh, for, for our customers. So it's been a really great success, this partnership that we've had with UAH um, and their, their I2C uh, facilities. It's, it's been fantastic. Um, also, for instance, uh, if you're from or around the Huntsville area, uh, you, you're probably familiar with the Space and Rocket Center. Uh, we have the Intuitive Planetarium there, which is a fantastic venue, I got to say. So if you if you are in Huntsville, if you go to the Space and Rocket Center, if you take your kids there at some point, uh, go to the planetarium and take in a show, um, especially during the summer. Uh, they are, they have uh, started doing multiple shows during the uh, during the week, and that's uh, that's sponsored by Intuitive. We do a, a lot of our presentations there. Uh, so it's, it's a great, fantastic facility, but it's just another example of how when we get into these areas, we really buy into the local area uh, and engage and, and make sure that we're uh, uh, that, that we are aligned with the uh, with the um, with the community. Uh, for instance, Casa uh, also we're huge in the Casa, so um, <clears throat> you'll you'll see a, a good bit of that when when you uh, uh, when you see an intuitive in, in a community. Um, bit of an eye chart. I don't expect you to read this. Uh, but uh, from a services perspective, a, a lot of folks say, you know, what do you do with Intuitive? Um, and if you've been in an organization or you, your organization has been around for as long as we have, which is 20, you know, a little over 20 years, you end up getting into a lot of different stuff. 
Um, and that's very true of us. So you, you can see from, if you have any type of technical expertise, we've probably done that type of work and um, we're, we're, we keep evolving what we're doing. So um, the, the, the crew that I came in, when I started with Intuitive two years ago, a uh, little cohort that I was, um, uh, I onboarded with was really diverse. Uh, I, I had an engineer, I, no, I'm sorry, I had a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer. I was coming in as a program manager, cyber, cloud guy, whatever. Um, and then there, there was a program analyst who mostly did financial work. Uh, so a really eclectic um, uh, set of experiences that, that we do, that we, uh, that we have at Intuitive. Uh, and it's because we have opportunities for just a, a wide variety of skill sets, backgrounds, expertise. Um, the, the one thing I will say about Intuitive, which is um, I didn't know about until you know day one when we were talking about it, uh, when we we're doing our onboarding, is we've never, in the 22 years we've been around, we've never let somebody go because we ran out of work. Uh, and that's pretty phenomenal when you stop to think about it, especially when you think about federal contracting. Um, it's, it can be a tough environment sometimes. Contracts come, contracts go. They typically last between three and five years. And if your um, if your company didn't re rewind the work, uh, oftentimes you're you know hopefully you're getting on with a new contractor. But you know sometimes you, you have to go look for another uh, another bit of employment. Um, that's not been the case with Intuitive. So if you come to work for Intuitive, um, we, we've not let somebody go because we lack work. And I, I don't want to tell you why here in a moment. It's it's kind of it's kind of unique. It's um, but I'll tell you a little bit about how we go about doing that. Um, so when you when you come into Intuitive, it's uh, we 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 hire uh, what I like to call Swiss Army knives. Um, we, we might have a a job opening for let's just call some a cybersecurity analyst, right? That's going to work on a on a very specific project um, for for one of our customers, um, but. We, we don't specifically hire for that role, right? So we wanna make sure that we have we hire somebody that's technically capable of, of doing the, the job, of course. Um, we also look for, for corporate fit, right? Are, are they gonna fit with the organization? Are they gonna work and play well with the, uh, the team? Do they bring a diverse set of background and expertise to the team to make them better? Um, but are they more well-rounded, right? So our program managers are, are responsible for having a plan A, B, and C for everybody that they bring on. Um, in fact, our CEO has told our, our program managers, um, if we get into a situation where you know, Chuck has lost, uh, his customer lost funding, or we lost a contract that Chuck's on um, and he doesn't have work, uh, well, it's the program manager's job is on the line. It's their job to have plan A, B, and C for our people. So we spend an inordinate amount of time um, making sure that our folks have options. And that's why people stay with us so long is because if you look at this, the services chart right here and the, and the breadth and depth of customers that we have, you can make an entire career um, and intuitive because you can go from one thing to another. You can find yourself from a uh, corporate perspective or a, a, a career perspective and there's going to be a place for you um, because we do all these different things um, and we make sure that we hire the right type of folk, folks that, uh, that can, uh, can adapt, uh, that are smart, um, that are innovative, and that bring a uh, almost a, that lean forward into their, into their job. So we, we spend a lot of time. Sometimes our hiring process is not fast, and that's on purpose. Um, and it's, it's because we, we, we look at a lot of different angles uh, from, from the folks that, that we bring on to Intuitive. It's, it's, not as, it's not as scary as it sounds, but again, well, we, we, we like to take care of our folks and make sure that, that you know, most of your waking hours are in your career. So we want to make sure that it's, that it's what you want to do. Um, so let me uh, move on a little bit. So, from a cable, some high level, so I'm going to pick a few things out from our, our services perspective. What, what are we doing really? Um, one of our major contracts that we that we do right now is, uh, is a software engineering based contract. It's called Mission Assurance, Software Mission Assurance for the Army, um, and that's uh, that's about a year and a half into it right now. But we're doing a ton of different things 
Um, like I said on the outset, working on software for uh, various Army aviation platforms, missile systems. Um, MDA is a big missile defense, sorry, missile defense agency is a big customer, uh, as well as several of the program offices uh, that, uh, that are in that area, like program um, PEO missiles in space, PEO aviation. Those are the big three uh, that come to us uh, for, for software help. And we do a, a ton of things in that area. Uh, everything from cyber, uh, information assurance, anti-tamper, uh, software verification and validation. So code comes in, uh, we got to scan it, make sure that it's uh, that does what it's supposed to do, when it's supposed to do. So we won't have an Apache go up in the sky. Um, it does what it's supposed to do and nothing beyond that. Um, so we want to make sure everything's good to go uh, on those birds uh, when, when, they, uh, when they go uh, and, and perform their missions. Uh, from a cyber perspective, we're all over the place. Um, this is this is really where I spend the vast majority of my day. So uh, we've been doing cybersecurity in the federal space for a long time, and if you if you say cyber in Huntsville, it means a lot of things. It means a lot of things to a lot of people, and that's not just Huntsville. It's, it's kind of broad. Um, but you have cyber from a uh, almost an accreditation perspective, where you're doing uh, making sure that um, all the uh, all the things, that, all the, the boxes are checked from a um, from a compliance perspective are done. That's a huge, huge part of federal cybersecurity is to scan, look for vulnerabilities, make sure that things that are uh, are done are done, uh, and, and that's just a, a, a massive part of cybersecurity. It's not what I might call um, operational cyber, not defensive cyber operations or even offensive cyber operations. That's not really what that's about. Uh, that's just one bucket of cyber. And then you have what you might think of traditionally cybersecurity when you're thinking about a knot or a SOC uh, or you're doing pen testing or something like that. Um, but we are doing a good bit of that for some other customers um, that we typically don't name um, in, in forums such as this. But uh, we, we do cybersecurity for that's more operational, both from a defensive and, off, and offensive uh, perspective um, for both commercial and federal partners. So. Um, there is just, if there's one area in, in, in intuitive that's growing faster than any, um, it's cyber, um, that's not going to be, <laughs> I mean, all of our, uh, all of our peers in this, in this market will tell you the same thing. Uh, we're all looking for the same talent. Uh, we're all recruiting the same people. Uh, and, and this is just a massive, massive growth area for us, not just locally, uh, but everywhere we're going. So you, you guys are in a great space at the, at the right time. It's an exciting time, actually. Um, we, we don't just put people in seats. So a lot of the things what we try to do is to differentiate is, um, we, we don't just, you know, go hire skilled folks and have them sit in a seat and do the work. Um, uh, we, we do build platforms. We do build intellectual property. Uh, we have uh, spent a, a lot of what I've been doing the last year and a half with my team is building, um, platforms, right? So we, we built a, a data analytics platform. Uh, a managed cybersecurity platform that we've taken to uh, commercial markets, uh, as well as uh, some of our federal partners. So uh, I have a, a team of folks that are, are diverse from an experience perspective, uh, cloud engineers, uh, cybersecurity engineers, analysts, and a couple of co-ops uh, interspersed with some of our engineers um, that have with me done architecting, building um, these, these platforms that are cloud-based um but are, are also architected where they can be deployed uh, on pretty much any infrastructure that can be containerized uh put it on a virtual machine but we just so happen to uh, stick it on uh on the cloud um so aws gov cloud secret region the ts regions uh so it's a pretty exciting time from a uh from an ip development perspective um customers that are using that right now um include uh, army federal partners so dod uh, we also have a major utility uh, using this platform to, uh, and, and we're doing their, um, their managed cybersecurity, and that, that area is growing significantly for us right now. Um, <clears throat> DevSecOps, so I mean, I'm sure you quite, you've heard a lot about that right now. Um, big for us uh, right now, especially with our customers. Um, from an Army perspective, they've been a little bit slower on the uptake. Um, our Air Force customers, however, have been leaning forward on that for quite some time. Uh, Cloud One, Platform One out there for, for Air Force is really, really taking DevSecOps, not just from a technology perspective, 
but also a cultural perspective and, and kind of really integrated that into what they do and how they are developing solutions for their customers, whether they're enterprise or operational or warfighters. Um, they're really instilling a DevSecOps uh, culture to make sure that they uh, learn fast, deploy fast, uh, and get uh, get code out to the uh, to the customer just as soon as they can. And, and, the, and a DevSecOps culture is helping them do that. And once you have the DevSecOps culture, the, the technology follows. Um, so our Air Force partners have been really, really leaning forward on that, um, a little bit behind commercial markets. Uh, and now Army is really picking it up as well, uh, seeing the success that we're seeing over there at, uh, at Air Force. Some of the cooler things we do, we've got Mike uh, in the screenshot right here, I caught him uh, in a picture, uh, is also take what we're doing from a data perspective, uh, but also uh, leaning on some advanced visualizations. So we've got a team of, uh, of um, folks working on uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and extended reality solutions um, to take all that data analysis that we're doing, but also represent that in a non-traditional way. So you talk, think about data analytics and you're thinking about a report, maybe even a graph or a Tableau or whatever, just you know, something that looks nice on a screen. Um, what our folks in the labs are doing right now is, is actually taking that a little bit further and, and demonstrating how we can use uh, advanced analytic, I'm sorry, uh, advanced visualization techniques to find what we like to call not a needle in a haystack, but a needle in a stack of needles. Um, and we have gotten some really, really um, folk, uh, folks who are really leaning forward in that in the, from the Army uh, because they have just a ton of data, whether it be from test data or operational data. They've got a massive, massive amount of data, uh, and it's usually not very clean data. Uh, it's not really labeled, uh, but they're also they're looking for interrelations of that data. What you know, what causes um, maintenance to uh, be needed on a certain item? When you have 400 data points or more, uh, that's hard to do uh, in traditional analytics. But uh, we're able to take that, put it into a data cloud, and find really how data relates through advanced visualization. So when I say we have a very diverse team, you got uh, digital artists on staff right now, uh, as well as uh, who, are, who are sitting side by side with our um, AI and ML developers and, and data scientists to put together these solutions. So uh, it's, uh, it's really fun actually to, to go to work and to uh, kind of sit with some folks who have a way of different backgrounds uh, and educations and career paths. Um, and when you do that, you get some really, really cool solutions. And that's, uh, that's some of the stuff that we're working on uh, in our immersive visualization areas. I, I touched on it earlier, but big data, uh, I actually should have slid, put this slide up a little bit earlier, but you know, when you boil everything that we do, uh, everything kind of boils down to a data problem. Uh, cybersecurity is nothing uh, but a, a massive data problem. Um, finding the finding the strings, pulling the strings, and then taking action, right? Um, so that's that's when we take all the things that we're doing from an analytics is, is an analytics problem, is it a uh, um, uh, predictive main, uh, sorry predictive maintenance problem, is it a cybersecurity problem, is it a modeling of sim problem? It all boils down to data, right? Uh, so that's why we uh, when we built our our data platform and have spent a um, a good bit of effort uh, making sure that that we are out there on the leading edge of, of data analytics and using advanced algorithms and um, investing in AI and ML techniques to find that needle in a stack of needles. Um, so obviously, if you're into AI and ML and you're also into cyber, there is actually a home for you too. Um, one of the things that we're working on right now um, from a cyber perspective in the, uh, the decide platform that we've got rolled out to, uh, to our utility and federal uh, partners is um, using AI and ML for, for advanced cyber detection. Um, why do I mention that? Um, it's, it's something that I'm, I'm kind of passionate about is a, a lot of folks when we, when we talk about doing cyber and defensive cyber operations, um, it's great. Uh, it's, it's usually let's pull in as much threat data as we can find, right? Uh, indicators are compromised. Pull them into our database uh, from multiple sources, whether they be closed source, open source, uh, um, uh, law enforcement partners, and do basically do pattern matching, right? Do I have any of these indicators of compromise that have shown up in, in my telemetry 
um, that I need to flag and do a response. And, you know, Sims do a fantastic job of that, right? Going through your logs, doing some matching, uh, using threat intelligence and, and surfacing that to the right folks to do the right things at the right time. What that relies on, however, is um, I, that somebody's already fingerprinted it, a, a threat, an, an IOC, an indicator of compromise. Somebody's already identified that that might be a problem. You've gotten it down into your system. It's been operationalized and you can find it in your system. What we're working on is what I'm, you know, cyber 2.0, right? It's Let's let's do let's use behavioral analytics, right? So uh, we've used behavioral analytics quite a bit to, to do insider threat analysis. But what we're doing is using AI, ML, kind of borrowing from behavioral analytics to to establish to observe systems, right? And, and and look for nominal operations of that system, nominal operations of that user, and over time establish a baseline, and then to monitor for off nominal behavior. Uh, and, and whether it matches an IOC or not could trigger an analyst to take a deeper look. It didn't trigger an IOC, but it was off nominal behavior for a system, for a user that may be an insider threat. It may not be, but it helps us learn so we can train our algorithms to be smarter and to look for threats that may not be fingerprinted quite yet, um, but are indeed threats. So that's actually a really exciting time for Matt for that right now. We have a couple of engineers that that's all they do right now. Is is work on uh, um, uh, behavioral analytics uh, for our for our cyber platforms. Really cool stuff. Um, so I think we are probably getting really close to the top of the hour. So I'm going to pause right now and see if we had any chat questions come up. Yeah, see if I can work Zoom. So, Chuck, if somebody wanted to contact you, um, how, yeah. can, how can they do that? Yeah, let me, uh, I'm going to put, I'm going to follow the lead of my TVA counterpart, and I'm going to put my email in the chat window. Okay. And y'all can contact me anytime. Uh, and we can, uh, we can talk. Um, job wrecks are out there right now. Uh, I know for a fact that I have multiple cyber ones out there. Um, because I wrote them and <laughs> put them out there, uh, so we have a, we're we're actively hiring for for, uh, for multiple positions right now. And somebody asked for the work website. Yep, work that. website. I'm working on that right now. It's not the uh, not the cleanest of URLs, but it'll get you there. <laughs> they didn't ask me when when selecting their domain. The nerve. Okay. So, um, Chuck, if you would like, uh, and if somebody wants to continue their conversation with Chuck, I would advise you to, uh, Steve, and, Steve Olson, you can help me, but I'd advise you, if you want, you can leave here and go into the um, break room called Coffee, Coffee One, okay. if, you want, if you want to continue that conversation. And Chuck, hey, thanks for taking the time. Um, I don't know where you're at, but you... Uh, I've got about 18 inches of snow to shovel, so I appreciate any excuse for not getting at it. Absolutely. Sounds good. All I got is rain. I have no snow to offer you, but uh, just rain. All right. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks. Y'all have a great one. Now, um, next up is Jill Hamilton, and uh, Jill represents uh, Clearance Jobs, which uh, – I was on their website a couple of times here, and it's a uh, uh, interesting website, Jill. I uh, I have a few questions. Hopefully, you can answer that uh, before we uh, get through with your half an hour. So, with that, Jill, I'll turn it over to you, and feel free to introduce yourself, uh, background, and uh, a little bit about Clarence Jobs. Sounds great. I am going to um, just share my screen real quick, and but while that's while that's happening, I am Jill Hamilton, and so yes, I represent Clearance Jobs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we are a security clearance uh, marketplace for people who have uh, security clearances. Um, so it's a job search marketplace, um, and of course, with the double screens, my it is yelling at me and doesn't like to. I'm yeah. a so, go ahead. I just land here. Welcome. 
All right, thank you. Um, exactly, you hit the hit the spot. Uh, I don't have a clearance, so how can I get one? What's the process? And you know, that's my question. Great Clearance question. Is. Yes. So the government pays for the clearances, but in order to have a clearance, you need to have a job that um, requires one. Um, so if your job does not um, have one, um, simply finding like different employers. Actually, when I first started working in the cleared industry years ago, um, I didn't start out with one, but I started a company that had both um, commercial jobs as well as clear jobs. And um, and so I got on a contract and then they um, had me submit that's called an SF-86. And I went through the whole background investigation process and got the clearance and was able to do the work on the contract. So that's pretty much the, the process in a nutshell it's just a matter of finding companies who you know desire to post you for clearance <laughs> and um so not every or not every company does that just because it requires upfront cost to keep people on the bench if they do not have um a clearance um okay so i actually don't i keep <laughs> i keep selecting share screen and selecting which screen i want and it is not actually sharing it. So I don't know if that's a user error or just perhaps to um, rights that I'm not getting, but, or if it's just the browser does not like me. Try it again, see if that works. Okay, all right, let's see. Right now it's sharing your screen, but everybody's gonna get an exercise in Zoom for, well, uh, <laughs> That's all right. So I'm just gonna start start going. Basically, if you do have a security clearance, um, what we love to call that is, um, it's like a golden ticket um, because you are in a very much more like narrow, um, like a focused market, if you will, where um, you can um, apply to a certain specific jobs that require security clearance. And what clearance jobs offers is a safe and secure uh, marketplace for you to post your profile. And if I ever do get my stuff to share, um, <laughs> I will I will walk through a little bit of that and the tips on using that. But it provides a place where employers can contact you. Our, our founder, Evan Lesser, started the company. We're celebrating 20 years now, actually. And he... Um, he started it right after 9-11, uh, just with this heart behind connecting the, you know, um, employers with cleared candidates. Um, and what's happening is that the amount of jobs that are that require security clearances, they continue to the, the demand increases and the cleared pool actually decreases. So if you do have a security clearance, especially in, in your cybersecurity is your background, you actually have a significant advantage with those two. It's kind of, it makes you a little bit of a double threat uh, in that um, the market is, it's in high demand in the cleared um, industry. And so having that on like that capability um, is just a really, it's a great factor for you. A lot of contracts like the DOD, um, it used to be the 8570 is now upgraded to the 8140 require like even a CompTIA security plus certification gives you a base that helps you meet just those baseline requirements. So you getting the certifications that you need um, it helps you meet contract requirements for um, uh, the d defense contractors that are out there. So, hey, hey Jill. Oh, sorry. I was just popping sure. back in. If you need help with the share screen, it's probably on my end. So that's why I'm <laughs> popping in. Okay. Didn't want to interrupt you, but I. Some of it's better visually if you can actually see some of the. And sometimes uh, the way it, when there's breakout sessions and this sounds trivial, but instead of sharing your screen, you share an application. I don't know if you tried Just give you that option. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, it ha it's showing me two different screens. Um, oh, let's try the Microsoft PowerPoint. Let's try. 
please grant browser access to screen. Okay. It's probably because I'm doing it in a browser. We use Teams yeah. at, here and not Zoom. And so in order to download Zoom prior to this, I require administrator access, which I do not have great cybersecurity, right? No, no, that's okay. So, uh, I'm just going to talk and <laughs> it's going to, I mean, I can send it to you in a second and then maybe yeah. if you could throw it up there. That's great. I can pull up um, your website um, and screen share if you'd like to, and if that's helpful, if not, no big deal. Uh, it's helpful. I think just to at least have a basis and a, a view there. That's great. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I just closed out of it because I was going to send you, send everything to you, but um so the key is, is having a secure place in order to um, search for your, for, for recruiters to search for you. Um, we love LinkedIn. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, anybody can access that. And that's not just us saying that, that's also lots of new sites reporting on the fact that um, like China loves to look through all the accessible um, candidates out there and so the value of clearance jobs, if you've not set up your own profile, is getting on there and um, only recruiters who, who have been vetted through us are able to access a site. You need to have a security clearance in order, either active or current, and I'll explain what the difference between that in a second, but um, you need to have a security clearance to join and then all your information is only available to the recruiters um, who are who have access to the site so active means that you are currently employed by a company on a contract or through the military or a law enforcement agency and you are actively being required to have a security clearance for your job current means it's within the last two years maybe you left an employer or you separated from the military um, and you had a clearance there most times, most people will not guarantee it, but it's usually good within two years of that. Um, then you would still have a current clearance where they would just transfer it from the one owning agency to that of the other, or um, it just, you're, the security officer uh, puts in those requests. But yeah, so clearance jobs, you just either log in or register, um, and then you um, set up your profile very similar to other sites. Uh, there's a toggle bar to click to make sure that you're searchable to employers and then you have access to contacting them with um, questions or i mean you can actually search all the jobs right now currently there's over 66,000 uh, jobs that require a security clearance uh, yesterday i chiseled it down to just it i took out anything that was like tech um <laughs> the tech editor and um and it was still over half of those jobs are IT related. Um, and then you can drill down even into like filter by cyber and like the different um, opportunities that you desire. Um, but there's a lot out there for you. Um, the other thing that we offer, so for me, I'm the editor for the news site. So I provide a lot of content on top certifications that uh, cleared personnel are receiving I provide, you know, intelligence updates on what's going on. If you want to stay abreast into like security happenings or um, espionage that's been happening or just overall the security clearance process where they're changing, maybe even like marijuana laws and how that impacts security clearances. Um, all those different questions we cover uh, every <laughs> on a weekly basis. So there's the new site provides a lot of options for listening to um, for, for following us on the content we post there for the news, as well as we have podcasts, YouTube channel, just a lot of different ways to stay up to date with everything. Um, so, yeah, so if you've not actually set up a, a profile, that would be your first step to go forward and do with clearance jobs. And then um, after that would be making sure that you're searchable by toggling that on and then starting to just like anything with um, anything with algorithms, the more more engagement you do, the more you are noticed by employers. Um, so if you upload your resume, that's that kind of pings the network. If you join a group, um, maybe you want to look at like you want to join a group that's specific to a certain subset of the country or you want overseas work or 
any of those different options and then you can um, actually get noticed a lot lot faster by employers so did you have a question oh you're welcome to ask any questions too especially since all my visuals yes are uh, I have, yes i have a question just to be clear sorry to take you back a bit just just to be clear you cannot uh, apply for security clearance ahead of a job. You need Correct. to have a job first, right? Right. You have to have an employer that will sponsor you for that security clearance. You can't oh, okay. personally actually apply for your own security clearance. Um, many of the contracts, like if you want to apply for a contract, I mean, federal agencies have jobs that require security clearances, contractors, obviously military, um, but they would be the sponsor for your clearance. And because the, there has to be a reason for you to have the clearance that you need access to classified information. Okay. Okay. So do, do, do you know the extent, the length of the process? How, how long does it take? <laughs> so it, it varies. First, for a secret clearance, it can take anywhere from the last uh, processing times were 112 days in the last quarter of last of last year. So it does take a bit of time to actually go through the process. That's why it's helpful to find employers who um, have both unclassified work as well as classified. That's usually my biggest um, recommendation for people if you want to get into this niche environment, because here again, um, the job security in this, in the cleared industry, especially in cybersecurity is high. Um, so for those of you who are really after um, that security, having the security clearance for a highly sought after job, I don't know if how much you follow the news with how much the government has to do to keep up with some of their lagging equipment and processes and procedures. Um, so the need is really great. And then even some of the companies that were here before talking about like protecting the warfighter and um, all, the, all the different tools and you know even just developing like the f-35 and the cybersecurity implications for that the the need is great um and the mission continues for anybody especially you're transferring out of the military it's a great way to to move on from supporting national security and then now in a very in a different capacity but it's that same mission right so it does take a bit of time um, and so when you find a, an employer who has other job opportunities, maybe uh, sometimes you have to be a little bit flexible to get in on a different contract because typically they don't love to sponsor somebody just on overhead to do nothing. Um, <laughs> so if they have other contracts that don't require cleared uh, a security clearance, sometimes you can then work your way onto a contract that requires a security clearance and then they can put you in for, for one, if that makes sense. So Jill, you gave a, a statistic just now. Was it 112 days, 120 days? Um, 112, yeah. So that 112, uh, are you pulling that data from uh, your your insight numbers, or are you, where are you seeing that? So we get that directly from DCSA. That's the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency, um, and that's for DoD industry clearance processing times. That not that's not necessarily for um, federal government, their own employees. Um, top secret's actually even longer. Top secret, the last quarter was 181 days um, just for a top secret clearance. Um, so go, that's like, half, if you think about it, that's like half a year, right? <laughs> and you're, um, if, um, you're saying that this is for jobs that are outside of the DOD or? No, it's specifically for industry. So it's the contractors. Got you. Um, and you expect those numbers to be longer or shorter? What is your guess on that? I actually, I do think that they could be getting shorter and they have improved drastically. Like at quarter one in 2020 for top secret was 280 days and they dropped that down to 181 days by quarter three, 2021, which is, which is great. They have, DCSA has done a great job in taking on the clearance process from OPM and reducing the timeline it takes in order to get um, people in their their 
background investigation completed and through adjudication and then cleared on the other side for for companies and it doesn't mean that you like for some places you can't work for 181 days but most places um and this is when you're starting from ground zero if you do not have a clearance if you already have a clearance that's why that's where like it's hugely valuable where you can just walk in and apply and um get right in on a contract and the reason why top secret takes long is they're they're going back it's at least 10 years i actually think it's 15 years um they're going back that that long in your history for places you've lived they're contacting all those people and it takes longer in the background investigation process to follow up on all those things uh, now what would you say are some of the benefits for someone uh who's already working in an agency to move out and and look for contract work or look for a job on clearance yeah you know i I advocate because I know plenty of people. I live in the DC area. I know plenty of people who work on both sides of the street. We write actually quite a bit about that on the news site um, because there's a lot of negatives sometimes for working in the federal government side. Love the government, um, and then and then there, but there's value in being for the contractor. So first of all, I would say always have your profile up. If you have a clearance, you can get a clearance job. Have that in there because you have the ability to just be a passive job seeker just to know what the, the market is. It's kind of like in real estate, looking on Zillow and just knowing what options you have, right? Um, and you don't have to be hyperactive, but you can at least keep a pulse check so you're not totally caught off guard. Because there are some differences between working specifically on a contract and filling in certain, certain roles. The biggest thing, the hardest, the challenge with going to a contractor and filling on and, and working on a contract is that you have a period of performance that might be three to five years. And so there is a little bit more turnover in that you know, some people like they'll win follow on contracts, they get extensions and it's not, they don't really feel that insecurity as much. And in cybersecurity, the greatest thing is that you have the ability to just to hop to different opportunities and keep building that resume of yours, um, which is, you know, you just get more and more experience and being able to have a, a bit more variety. I'd say if you're at one specific agency, it's probably a bit of slower um, change. You're not really going to be, you might not be as exposed to much, but you are driving the ship more. So you are signing off on the, the opportunities, the contracts coming in. Um, so there is a little bit more ownership in that. Got you. And, and with regard to pay, uh, what do we see in the discrepancies there? Yeah, I, so I, I actually do the compensation survey uh, for clearance jobs for the past few years. I'm in the middle of writing the next report. So I do think you should keep your eyes out for that. Um, it really just depends if you're looking to go back and forth. I do typically see um, federal government can typically pay less, but not it's not on a whole, but if you get into organizations that are a little bit more dynamic and flexible, like CISA, uh, who's also, they have jobs posted on our site as well. So it's not just contractors on our site. We have Space Force is, uh, has jobs listed, uh, CISA does. Um, some of the newer agencies, if you look on their site there, the, the compensation, I think, um, they will pay more, especially within cybersecurity. I mean, it is what they do, right? So, um, but without having the numbers right here in front of me, um, you can you can search also, I've posted on our site, like a top 10 um, certifica uh, certifications that pay. Um, and that was based on the results of cleared uh, personnel responding to my compensa the compensation survey I send, send out every fall and just which which certifications pay more and how much more and how that compares. I will say by and large, people who have certifications within the cleared industry, whether it's even for PMP or you know, project management, your PMP or a Six Sigma, um, all, just having at least one certification, there's a there's like a ten thousand dollar difference in that, um, and then I've also d done a deeper dive into where you see you have like an MBA, a graduate degree, plus experience, plus a certification. That's like a I call that the triple threat, <laughs> where it just it really boosts 
your earning potential within the cleared industry. Wonderful, thank you. So uh, if we wanna follow your data and any of the new uh, postings, then we would go to a clearance jobs and just find your name? Yeah, so, and, and if you have any questions for me too, um, I'll put this in the chat in a second, but you can just email me at editor at clearancejobs.com. Um, and then, so you can check out the news site. If you go to clearancejobs.com, there's a tab for the news site. Um, and you can follow all the different information. There are search bars there where you can search for different topics and find more information. We also have a blog too, just specifically on security clearance questions that come up. People who are like, I did this, 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 this all in my background. What are my odds of making it through adjudication? You know, and there's even like former background investigators and um, FSOs, um, facility security officers who regularly visit the blog and give a lot of great information on there. And then we just write a lot of content. Um, I'm editing probably four to five articles a day. So at least during the week, right? And uh, we have a lot of great content on there for you about your security clearance, about cybersecurity, um, defense contracts that have been awarded, all the different resume tips, making a military transition, um, all those things, that content's there on the regular. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jill. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I have two questions. Uh, number sure. one, uh, can you please put the link for the blog and the chat for us? That is number yes. one. Number two, I heard you mentioning a few minutes ago about Security Plus. Does that mean there are employers just looking for people that have Security Plus with clearance? So recruiters on our site are specifically looking for people who have a security clearance. So whether that's a secret clearance or a top secret clearance. Um, but yeah, they are specifically looking for that. Not necessarily, they're looking for all sorts of, like it could be logistics. We have a lot of different job categories. But we have a lot of IT and cyber options available. Um, there's over 66,000 listings on our website, but they all do require security clearance. Hope that answers okay. your question. Um, I have a question too. Sure. Yeah, so my question is about experience. Uh, I just joined, so I don't know if you want to talk about that. Um, if you have Security Plus, but you don't have like real time experience, you only have it through your studies and stuff, and you have clearance, what are your chances? Okay, so you're saying you do have a security clearance? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. I, I don't I don't do cybersecurity in the army, but mm -hmm. I am taking these courses and I'm taking the uh, certifications and I have secret clearance. So what are my chances okay. of getting the job? Well, I'm sure they're I'm sure they're great. <laughs> so <laughs> I can't tell you your chances, but what I can say is you have a security clearance, so you need to go to clearancejobs.com, set up a profile. And, and then to make sure you toggle to be searchable. And then you have your certifications listed. We have all types, of, like I said, there's 66,000 jobs listed on the site. Over half of them are either IT related and then a good number are um, cyber as well. So you should be getting contacted in like, right, like it's fresh person on the site, you know, like you'll trigger all the different alg algorithms and, um, you can choose to follow up with different people. I mean, it's kind of a, it's a great passive way to look for different opportunities that are out there. And you can also then search, I mean, all those opportunities are searchable for you. So if you don't have a clearance for those of you in the room that don't have that, uh, I also see one that if you had a TSSCI, but it's since expired, um, you can actually still search the site. You'd still have to, if it's completely expired, you would have to, re it does restart the process. It's not like this, it could, it could potentially simplify it, especially if you have your SF86 already like available. Some people like to print that out or have it saved. It will be faster in filling it out. Um, but if it's not expired, especially like, I, I'm not sure when you join, but if, if it's within two years of you leaving a job that required a top secret clearance, um, often it's still current, even if it's not active, meaning like somebody's not actively owning it right this second, if that makes sense. So um, definitely, if you have the clearance already, go and open up a profile. 
if you don't have, if you uh, see it was 2014. So what I would do is search all the open opportunities. There's a filter in the search bar where you can actually um, hone in on, um, or use a Boolean search if you put it in quotation marks, where you can actually hone in on employers who are either willing to sponsor is a good term to use for searching for that, or find employers who have, um, you find employers who have both cleared opportunities and you know, you see them in other places, they have opportunities that are not clear, like they're unclassified work and try to get on, just get inside the company so that you can work your way into there. Um, so somebody asked about what about the, the, those that clearance is in the continuous evaluation program for TSSCI. That's a great question. Um, so far, DSCSA has actually said that it's still the two year window. If you've left somebody, if you've left an employer and you had a top secret clearance or a secret clearance and you were in, enrolled already in continuous evaluation, it's still about a two year window that you have um, at this point. That could change. Um, <laughs> that those things can always always get adjusted to us but at this point they are still saying to us that um it's within the two years then okay all right i am about to put in my email address at, down in the win um the chat bar uh, so it's editor at clearancejobs.com and then if you go to clearance jobs.com is the main website. If you go there, then you can actually, um, there's a link on the site for clearance jobs blog, and then you can find more information on any questions you have about, hey, I had this incident happen to me. <laughs> um, I mean, there's all sorts of questions, you know, I drank too much five years ago or anything like that. What is this going to impact my security clearance or I need to go through the whole, um, I need to go through the whole process um, again. Um, what, what, what do I do for that? So, all right. I still see, you can just go to clearancejobs.com and then you scroll to the bottom, but I'm going to go one more step for you and I'm going to go find that blog link so I can put it right in here. And then to check out the content that I, um, putting up on the website regularly. It's just news.clearancejobs.com, which the link is right there on the site. So it's easy to toggle back and forth. So, all right. Any other questions before I think I have about two more minutes? So I'm happy to answer any questions. I do have a question. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I joined a little bit later. You probably sure. already answered this. I do apologize. Um, no worries. Is it, is it worth, so I don't have a clearance and I know that you said all of the jobs on the site require it but is it worth it to go like do they sponsor a person to give the clearance or do mm -hmm. you already have to help me understand that again thanks yeah no worries so if you go to clearancejobs.com and select uh, job search there's 66,000 jobs listed there and then what you would want to do is narrow your search um, for like a search from like willing to sponsor or um uh, I think there's actually one of the filters. If you click the down ar arrow, um, it's under clearance, um, unspecified even, could get you a number of them. You can also even look for public trust. Public trust positions are often, um, because the vetting process is so much um, lighter, they will, you know, you could probably try applying and the, the turnaround time is faster. So an employer might be more willing to put you forward for that. And then you can kind of keep trying to find other contracts to jump around onto. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And there are public trust positions out there on the site. I see somebody asking if you have a public trust clearance that we do have those options there. All right, and I am, it looks like I am at time. So um, happy to answer any and all questions. I'm probably going to pop out since I have four kids here at home. But uh, if you have any questions all for me, feel free to email me. It's editor at clearancejobs.com. Jill, thanks a lot. I, uh, I learned a lot uh, in this <laughs> half an hour. I appreciate your time and uh, uh, and your willingness to talk to us as a group. So um, for those of you out there, uh, we uh, do have Red speaking at 830. If you want to join, uh, you can go to the other room. Otherwise, I think you, you are uh, pretty much dismissed, right, Steve? 
Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Jill, for for having uh, you here. Yeah. We're really we're really thankful for that. Clearance jobs is awesome. Um, really glad I stumbled upon that a long time ago <laughs> once I entered this sector. Um, and look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, I encourage you all. Our last um, and only speaker at eight thirty is Red Hat in the other breakout session, like uh, Mr. Mudge just mentioned. So, howdy. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? Excellent. Good. All right. Oh, hold on. I'm having having some technical difficulties here. Give me a second. There we go. All right. We're going to give it. Um, yeah, Nick, it looks like you're going to be the first one to talk. So, um, yeah. <laughs> all right. Give it a little bit more time. Okay, so I am uh, recording this uh, just so those who couldn't make it, um, you know, have the information. So I am going to introduce, I'm just going to call you Nick K because I don't know how to pronounce your <laughs> last name. Nick is good too. I don't, I don't think there's any other Nicks <laughs> okay. in here. So yeah, okay, totally fine. Uh, yeah. All right. So I want to introduce um, Nick. So he is here with us from Dice.com, um, which is a platform for tech professionals. Um, it's, a, it's a recruiting platform that helps out prospective employees. Um put prospective employees in front of opportunities that make the most sense at every stage of your tech career. Um, so Nick, would you like to take it away? And then I'll kind of um, let you know when you're getting short, you know, short on time, I'll give you pr uh, probably in a chat, in the chat, I'll, you know, let you know what your time's looking like. So you've Great. got a half hour. Okay. Fantastic. So, um, as you just heard Gerald mentioned during his really excellent talk, one of the best ways to sort of make your introductions within the cybersecurity industry is to join the community, you know, participate in Discord servers, you know, go online, go to GitHub, kind of find people who whose interests align with yours in terms of cyber and, you know, learn from them. And then from there, once you've sort of built up these networks, then you can begin to explore the possibilities of the cybersecurity job market. What DICE does is we're obviously one of those places where once you feel confident in your skills, once you're ready to sort of reach out and grab that entry level position, various employers obviously list dozens, hundreds, thousands of cybersecurity positions on the site every week, every month, and so on. Um, both in terms of the federal government, uh, private employers, everyone you know in between state and local governments. Uh, one of my colleagues from Clearance Jobs actually will be speaking in a little bit about um, the jobs that involve top secret clearance, um, but that that's kind of a completely separate thing that they they will cover. Um, in terms of Dice itself, it's it's really an excellent time to get on a job board or a job marketplace and explore what the cybersecurity market has to offer. Um, I was actually just looking at a study this week that showed that the global cybersecurity workforce is about, I think off the top of my head, 65% below what organizations need to fill in terms of current open cybersecurity positions worldwide. And as of a month or two ago, I think that in North America, there's there's a 400,000 job shortfall, which is really incredible. And it means that no matter what you want to do, whether you want to be an analyst, whether you want to be part of a red team, uh, chances are really good that there is an open position for you. Um, you know, and obviously, when you go on to DICE, when you apply for jobs, when you begin to interact with these hiring managers and recruiters and other people who are on the hunt for cybersecurity talent, they will want to evaluate your skills. Um, they will want to, as Gerald just alluded to in his talk, they want to make sure that your skills are absolutely current, you know, that you are also aware of all the various threat actors out there um, who can potentially cause an organization trouble. But the other thing that we'd like to highlight when you are applying for jobs is also the soft skill part of it, you know, empathy, communication, and so on. Because one thing that a lot of cybersecurity professionals end up doing, not only are they repelling threats, you know, making sure that the network is secure and so on, but they are also interacting with other stakeholders throughout the organization. They are explaining the threats. They are explaining what they are doing to not only your boss, but also people on other teams and so on who might not have your knowledge base in terms of cybersecurity. And so being able to kind of explain core concepts, teamwork, all those, all those good things that come with, with soft skills you know, are vital towards, towards landing positions. Um, that's sort of obviously the 35,000 foot view 
in terms of approaching the cybersecurity markets. Um, does anybody have questions? Anything that I can I can answer? I realized that was kind of again a very top level view, but I want to see kind of what people um, are interested in before I go any further. Yeah, there's nothing in the chat right now that I'm seeing. Um, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yes. Hi. Yes. Uh, I have a question, uh, and um, let's say you you're filling out a form, a job application. So uh, we know that both of those program, they are written on algorithm based model where they screen, they can scrutinize candidate. So what what are the keywords that we need to look at to when we we fill in this application? So because chance are before even you get a chance to be in front of a recruiter, the system already try to uh, scrutinize you. Mm -hmm. That's my question. Yeah, no, that's a really excellent question. And this is one that we deal with a fair amount. Fortunately, there's also a very straightforward answer to it. And it's that when you are reviewing the initial job posting, 99% of the time that job posting is filled with keywords, whether it's the certifications you might need, whether it's the cyber skills you might need and so on. And so when you're designing your application materials and tailoring your resume to that specific position, you should take those keywords from the job posting and insert them into, the app, into your application materials. Now, there's two sort of key caveats to that. Um, the first one is that if you're going to put a keyword in, particularly if it has to relate to a skill or certification or something like that, you absolutely must have that thing. I mean, it might be tempting to kind of stuff your application materials with as many keywords as humanly possible, but A, the algorithms are designed to detect that sort of keyword overstuffing and there's a higher possibility that they will reject your application. But also if you manage to get through that part of the process, you know, and you end up in front of a recruiter or a hiring manager, they are going to evaluate you on those skills. So when you're reading the job posting, examine you know, the skills and the keywords and so on, they absolutely know, make sure that, you know, the exact wordage is in sort of the application materials, and then your chances of passing through that initial algorithmic screening are actually quite high. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Okay. Any other questions before Nick continues? Uh, yeah, if you got a second, I dropped it in chat, but I can wait if you need. Oh yeah, let me let me take a look. I was just wondering. I'm looking at Dice now, and uh -huh. I'm wondering: is this more of a consolidated job search site, or are hiring managers and recruiters got their own portal on this and using this to search out candidates as well? So they do have their own portal, and they are using it to search out candidates. That, that's absolutely correct. Um, and then, obviously, on the candidate side of the equation because they are posting jobs, you know, it's, 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 it's a two way street in that sense. So is there like a build a profile with this other than just submit my resume type thing where you can expound like LinkedIn has, or is it really just uh, specifically to drop your resume in and put the basics in? Um, there is a profile builder and, and you're asked to list your skills, how many years you've had with those particular skills and so on. And then that, um, once you've built up your profile, that becomes an integral part of what recruiters and hiring managers and everybody are looking at when they um, are on the site. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, Nick, do you just wanna give a brief overview? What exactly, um, you know, how would people go about, you know, obviously uh, Tom is on dice.com, but you just wanna give a brief overview of exactly what you guys do, how would they go about, you know, working with your company, all that good stuff. Yeah. So when you're on the dice site itself, I mean, as we were just talking about, you, you, you build a profile and then like a lot of other job marketplaces, there's a search bar and you input whatever my particular, you know, for example, if you want to work on a red team, you could enter red team into the search bar and then and whatever jobs are out there nationwide and you can filter by location, and other kind of neat things. Um, it will then obviously kind of produce the, the jobs that are available. Uh, there's contracting, there's full-time, there's part-time. Um, we've also been seeing a rise in remote positions, obviously with the pandemic and so on over the past couple of years. 
And so that, that's another factor that you kind of have to consider as well. Some people really, really want to go into an office or they want to kind of work in a hybrid way. And that's totally, that's great. Um, but then we've also been seeing an uptick in cybersecurity positions that you can do from home, which is also really useful because whereas pre-pandemic, generally you had to live relatively close to your employer. Now, a lot of employers are broadening their horizons. And even if you live 3,000 miles away, you know companies that are on the hunt for remote cybersecurity experts will go through the whole interview process with you. Um, you know, and you can you can land a remote position where you get to do things from a completely different time zone. I think somebody might have a question. Yeah. Yeah, um, and we've got about fifteen minutes left for your for your okay. spot. Um, uh -huh. Are there any other questions? Um, so part of that, I, I know that. Uh, Dice that can, we can uh, uh, find a lot of job. What are other websites we should be considering? If uh, later we can have a list of those sites, that would be great. Yeah, we're, um, I mentioned this in the chat in the main room. We are going to try all these websites being given in the main part by the speakers. We are going to try to get a resource list together for all of you to send out when we send the recording. And also, I, I just want to emphasize, I mentioned this at the beginning of the talk, but I mean, one of the really key elements in all this is networking. I mean, apply, learning the skills that you need, earning the certifications, applying for jobs. I mean, that's obviously kind of the, a really super vital part of this whole process. But building up the community around you is a really excellent way to kind of figure out what's happening because it really is, you know, word of mouth and so on, you know, that that opens up a lot of positions to you. So Go on the Discord servers, go on social media, um, go on Reddit. There's there's a lot of places where cybersecurity experts congregate um, that can alert you to opportunities and also allow you to keep your skills current because in those chat rooms and Discord servers and so on, they're talking about you know, the latest and greatest and threat actors, skills, tools, and so on. And so it's, it's really important to um, just continually keep visiting those sites every day. Hey, Nick, on the point of uh, skills that we should be building, uh, have there been any trends that you've seen over the past year or so um, from employers? Uh, are there certain things they're looking for, certain keywords that you've seen um, in addition to the rise in, in remote work options? Yeah, yeah, and that's a really excellent question. So we've done a number of internal surveys, and we've also been um, – obviously kind of reading and analyzing a number of third person or third party surveys that are produced by cybersecurity companies. Um, I have a cybersecurity analyst who, who sort of chews up the market for us. Um, a lot of them, I'm, I'm trying to recall the data off the top of my head, I think roughly half of the respondents to a survey that we ran recently were really concerned about cloud infrastructure. And that's a reflection of the pandemic and the fact that companies were once sort of consolidated in a physical space and now you have employees and contractors and everybody spread all over, which just increases the attack surface exponentially. And so a lot of companies are really terrified that, you know, now there's all these potential intrusion points onto the network, you know, and, and they really want cybersecurity experts who can come in who know their cloud infrastructure, who know the vulnerabilities in AWS and Azure and so on, and can close those holes before something really bad happens in terms of a threat actor. Um, endpoint security, application security. I mean, that, that's a perennial thing, but applications are always evolving, which means that they're always vulnerable in some way or another. Um, mobile device management is always key. I mean, it's always been key. It always will be key. Um, knowledge of zero trust concepts is something that I've also seen percolating a lot lately when I've been talking to people. I mean, the idea of zero trust is becoming more important than ever. Um, I think those, I mean, if I had to kind of give like the most top level, I would say that those are kind of the things to, to plunge into. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, this is Kim. I have, huh? a, I have a question. Um, I come in this from a little bit different perspective. I did, um, I have an MBA and then okay. I did about five years of workforce management. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've got a little bit of a cold. Okay. Now, 
I'm coming in from the perspective of like MSP programs. So like managed service providers, I don't know mm -hmm. if those mean anything to you, like sort of HR and managing the actual workers that you then plug into the clients. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I've been doing the cybersecurity um, training program for about a year. I'm kind of a bridge between the two is kind of what it, where I see my niche. Is there any, any, are there any jobs like that there that are out there that you know of? Let me know if you need any clarification on what I'm trying to ask. No, no, I, I understand what you're asking. And I think, I mean, that there's off the top of my head, I, I don't know any specific jobs in that particular area, but I mean, it is an area, obviously anytime you have any sort of intersection between, you know, a third party or a client or whatever, then that's that's sort of a prime attack spot for people who want to infiltrate the network. And so there, there's always, especially at the enterprise level, there's there's always opportunities there, um, especially since those systems are so huge and disseminated over kind of a wide attack, potential attack surface. Um, you know, companies are always paranoid that somebody's going to find a way in that they're going to be able to exploit a vulnerability. So I think, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity there, but I, off the top of my head, I, I don't know of any specific positions. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Sure. Okay, we've got about 10 more minutes. Um, are there any other questions for the, for Nick for dice.com? Now's your chance to ask. I can, I've got, I've got lots of, I can, I can yeah, give kind of a broad please overview. Please share, of yes, so, please share more. So in terms of, I mean, we've been dropping the term threat actor a lot. Um, a couple of, there's been a couple of trends evolving, certainly in the last couple of quarters that are sort of solidifying into long-term trends. And so when you are interviewing with hiring managers and recruiters, um, some things that will likely pop up again and again, you know, and you'll likely be asked your opinions on them and how you would theoretically deal with an attack situation involving them um, include ransomware. Um, ransomware, I think last year, I, the, inter, the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center got a couple of thousand um, ransomware complaints. And I think it was like a 50 or 60% increase year over year. And this year, I mean, there's, it's probably going to increase another 50 or 60%. Uh, spear phishing, phishing, so on, like a lot of organizations are being targeted in increasingly sophisticated ways by these gangs that are extremely good at ransomware. And so knowing sort of the latest and you know, most terrible attacks that can potentially be launched and how to counter them is going to be more important than ever. And having that knowledge will open up a lot more job opportunities. So that's kind of a, a key thing. Um, just as an aside, healthcare, if you're interested in cybersecurity and healthcare context, a lot of hospitals and so on have been hit lately by ransomware. And so that's kind of a, a, a really growing issue within that particular space. Um, there are also supply chain attacks. As I was mentioning a moment ago, a lot of larger companies use a number of vendors for all sorts of things within the tech stack. And some of those third-party companies, their security is a lot weaker than at other ones. And so, you know, as a cybersecurity expert, you're going to be asked to kind of defend the tech stack end to end and sort of prevent all of these attackers who are really interested in these supply chain attacks. So, if you're looking to sort of research that a little bit further, um, I would look at the Solar Winds attack, which is that huge high-profile attack that resulted in the infiltration of a lot of organizations and federal agencies. Um, that's kind of the textbook example of how one of those is carried out and also offers some sort of tips and highlights on how to potentially repulse one. Um, the other thing too, and this, this is where all of you come in, is frankly, there's a real talent gap right now in terms of what companies need and you know what they haven't been able to source in terms of cybersecurity talent. And so as long as there's these gaps where companies can't find the people they need, their vulnerabilities are just going to be there. And so as you're sort of progressing through your cybersecurity career, um, you're going to be more important than ever because once you, these companies need to fill these gaps and unless they fill these gaps, they're always going to be vulnerable um, to all sorts of attacks that can harm them in mission critical ways. So I think I think it's it's great that you're doing this because um, you know this this is this is the future. Great. Um, we did have a, a question in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. 
Kosi asks if there's any multilingual opportunities. Uh, I think he speaks French and English, it looks like, in, you know, in the cybersecurity world. There are. Uh, cybersecurity is an international affair. Um, a lot of the threat actors who are targeting the U.S. government and companies and so on um, are based overseas. Um, you know, there's 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 a lot of not just French, but also Russian. Russian is 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 really key um, right now. What I've heard from some of our cybersecurity experts. Um, but yeah, no, there's 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 always bilingual opportunities. And when you're looking at a job posting on Dice or anywhere else. Um, when you look at the required skills frequently, you will see those languages popped up, usually as preferred as opposed to required, but depending on um, what the company is and what their focus is and so on, yeah, French, Russian, um, all sorts of languages often come into play, just given the international scope of cybersecurity. Nick, so if you were advising a family member uh, who was interested in cybersecurity and, and or wanted to pivot in, into the, the cyber world, um, what advice would you give them? That is a really good question. I would, I mean, cybersecurity as an umbrella term encompasses, I mean, there's, there's a whole different range of what they could do. Um, I would encourage them to go online. I mean, don't necessarily jump into a Discord server or something like that immediately, but certainly go online, go to Reddit, go to GitHub, go to Hacker News, um, and just sort of get a feel for what the current issues are in cybersecurity and how people are approaching that and so on. And that will sort of help give them an idea of what to particularly focus on. Um, you know, and then once they have a focus or a couple of different areas that they potentially want to focus on education, you know, comes into play. And then when you sort of get into the, the job application part of the process, when you're really sort of starting to take the first steps into landing the position, you know, skills are really helpful, you know, obviously. And so, um, you know, mastering particular skills, you know, a lot of people are self-starters in cybersecurity. So they love to learn, they go online, they talk to people, they figure out kind of where vulnerabilities are, they figure out the tools to stop those vulnerabilities. Um, a lot of jobs out there also ask for cybersecurity certifications of various types. And so if you've truly committed yourself to a cybersecurity career, then you need to start thinking about, oh, you know, what certifications do I need to particularly earn to land a certain job or do, if I want to work for the federal government, do I need to get top secret clearance because I want to work for the NSA or an organization like that? So um, I would, I mean, the best advice would just sort of be take your time, you know, you don't rush into it, sort of see what you potentially want to specialize in, like what really excites you on an emotional level in addition to an intellectual one, and then proceed from there. Perfect. Thank you so much. Sure. All right. And we have, um, we've got about four minutes. So this might be the, the last question um, that's in the chat. Uh, Donna asks, what are some of the top positions, titles, and scope you're seeing as critical to hire for large and small companies in the world of cybersecurity? In other words, what, what are the positions that are in the highest demand right now for cybersecurity? So cybersecurity analysts are in very intense demand right now. Um, and that's because you companies everywhere and the federal government need people who can take a really holistic approach, kind of see the entire environment as it is, and then give an accurate assessment of what the, who the threat actors are and kind of what needs to be done in order to keep, you know, the system secure. So um, I would say cybersecurity analysts would probably be one of the, the major ones. Um, Working on a red team is is certainly a fun job. I actually have a close contact, close professional contact who works on a red team for a major um, tech giant, one of the Fang companies, and you know it, that not only involves infiltrating systems digitally, but also like trying to physically break into data centers and things like that. That's a very highly specialized job that's always in demand because companies always want to make sure that they're cybersecurity procedures and protocols are sort of state of the art. Um, so there's, a, and it's also, a, a, depending on circumstances can be very highly pain. So I think cybersecurity analysts, red team experts, and so on, I mean, the, those, those are probably the two jobs that I would pursue if I were, if I were on a cybersecurity job track. 
Thank you. And okay, one, one last question. Um, how can people get in touch with you if they were to need to? Uh, is there an email address or something you could provide us? Sure. I will, I will drop my email in the chat right now and feel free to reach out to me with, with any questions you have. I will be absolutely more than happy to dump more data on you about the job market in this than, than you could ever hope or want. All right. Thank you very much, Nick. Sure um, we appreciate you joining us. All right. So we are going to go ahead and move on to the next um, business, um, which is it's going to be Marty, uh, Marty Lowe with MSI. Um, so MSI has 20 plus years of experience in the areas of HR, talent management, um, and employee relations. They're proud to support regional and international clients in the areas of customer service support, manufacturing, logistics, accounting, engineering, IT, and health and wellness. They believe in core values of mutual respect and accountability as an excellent value proposition for clients and candidates. Marty, take it away. Oh, you're on mute, Marty. <laughs> You're, you're very good and you make it very quick. Thank you so much. Uh, it, and it's great to meet you virtually. Also want to make sure uh, that I give a, a real salute to Nick. Great information. Um, Rex, great information. Ian, um, who, who actually we're, we're in the same uh, town, believe it or not, Chattanooga, Tennessee. So uh, I really enjoyed all of the content presented so far. And yes, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I am Marty Lowe, President and CEO of MSI Workforce Solutions. Uh, founded in 2015. And uh, to, to provide just a brief introduction, I started out where a lot of you students are, meaning, um, you know, played sports and uh, worked after school and, 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 and went to college and thought I wanted to be, uh, you know, one thing. And so over time, I had the opportunity to go to work for a company. Um, and, and 12 years later, I uh, had the opportunity to uh, to do something that I loved. And there have been several presenters that talked about purpose, uh, uh, do something that you, you're you really going to uh, be uh, challenged to do, but also something that's going to uh, allow you to get that that personal gratification for solving a problem, whether it's, uh, you know, fintech or healthcare or, or what, whatever vertical it is. Also wanted to elaborate a little bit on Nick's uh, presentation. Uh, some, I think he mentioned healthcare. And so a lot of the time we don't talk about some of these outlying or, or other areas that are critical to have talent like yourselves uh, in spaces. Uh, there is obviously a shortage. And so for us, um, we are currently working uh, with uh, some of the presenters and companies that are actually uh, uh, here with us tonight. We're very fortunate um, having been in business five and a half, almost six years. Uh, I'll tell a quick story about uh, someone in a similar position as all of you uh, looking at uh, what should my next step be? What am I going to enjoy doing? Uh, what work culture um, am I going to enjoy uh, for all of the hard work and effort that I put in? And so that's what MSI Workforce Solutions does. Uh, we do offer um, a, a high level of support, uh, workforce development, career training, um, some of you will want to go and work directly for a Cisco or an Erlanger or a TVA. Um, and, and you may be there for another you know, 10, 15 or 20 years. There are many that we're, we're gleaning questions from um, that they do want to start out in a role to make good money. Um, they want to expand their, uh, their skill set, uh, take what they've learned, plus learn new things on the job. And so a lot of them are asking about positions that would allow a 90 day, a six month, a year or a 24 month uh, contractor role uh, pays very well, uh, benefits uh, the whole nine yards, but it allows you to go work for a company like TVA, um, learn new things, but still have uh, some of the um, all of the experience, all of the, the, the high fast paced setting. Um, you work with some of the best in the business but you can work for 90 days or six months or a year uh, and then know that you have a partner and a plan to make that transition maybe to another vertical or another area of expertise. And so we do that on a direct hire basis, meaning uh, if you apply to one of our current positions or positions that we will post and uh, you're looking for a full-time opportunity, uh, we obviously partner with companies like TVA or, or we we're, we're, uh, provide some sub opportunities for companies like TVA and others. So we're gonna treat you just like our full-time employee. Uh, we're gonna help you get through 
some of the uh, challenges of interviewing, some of the challenges of uh, preparation for interviewing. Um, uh, you heard great information from Rex earlier about you're a commodity. You're a you're one of the most sought after uh, uh, areas of focus for talent management, talent development, uh, as well as filling critical roles as there is. Um, you know, for those for those of you who uh, have played sports or music, uh, you understand why uh, basketball players or, or 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 football players or musicians uh, they have an agent not because their talent is not good enough to get their foot in the door or not good enough for them to be super successful while on the job. Typically they have an agent, they have a partner that helps them identify opportunities. Um, uh, I think it was Dr. Osher who mentioned uh, networking, professional networking, um, creating um, high character, high results, high relationships, uh, whether online, uh, within networking communities, and that's exactly what MSI does. We represent many companies uh, who are looking for talented individuals, uh, looking to get in, um, work with great organizations, uh, and that is in that, that's within multiple multiple capacities. Uh, we use the example of uh, hospitals uh, and health systems. There are doctors who are full time with a practice. There are doctors who are only working PRN. They're working two days a week. Uh, there are nurses. Uh, that, that only work two to three days a week or only on the weekends. And so uh, companies are becoming much more flexible. Uh, they realize that for some, uh, they want to work 50, 60 hours a week. For some, they uh, work-life balance is critically important. And for us as intermediaries and, and support, uh, a support, a full, full high-level support team of HR executives, uh, highly skilled recruiters, account management, um, and then support staff, um, that will respect your career path, um, your career objectives, and then frankly, give you good advice uh, on everything from prepping for uh, now, you know, two or three years ago, we were talking about dressing for success. And we were talking about, you know, make sure that you, uh, I think Rex said, map out where you're going, uh, make sure that, you know, you, 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 you don't have a, a jelly stain on a white shirt. But now you're seeing a lot of these interactions uh, being facilitated primarily, primarily online. But there is even good online etiquette uh, that just helps you get your foot uh, forward. Uh, and, and, and if we can help you better prepare in any capacity, that's what our team does. Uh, so as a, as a brief example, Mr. Lee is someone um, applied for a position, um, had been working for a company uh, maybe two or three years. Um, and once he went through the process, and, and this is with one of the larger uh, companies uh, that's represented here, uh, we ended. We were in, we were able to end up offering him a twelve to twenty four month full time contractor role, at about forty percent more on an hourly rate. Uh, he is eligible for benefits. Um, he works for MSI, you know, as a contract professional remotely, uh, and he really feels like like we do. Uh, he really feels like um, he's gotten the best out of the relationship. Uh, that, that we were able to establish in a pretty short time. Um, I don't remember the presenter, but I'll, I remember the reference. When I need someone, when TVA, when Erlanger, when EPB, when a lot of these companies uh, or facilities, when they need talent, they typically need talent yesterday, especially um, as important as it is to uh, safeguard uh, information uh, and, and that's a lot of what a lot of uh, you guys would, would probably be doing uh, at some capacity. So for us, having a pool of qualified professionals that may be uh, actively working, but looking for either another um, uh, opportunity as far as time, uh, maybe they don't want to work as much, uh, they may be looking to, to relocate, whatever the case is, we're going to establish a relationship, understand exactly what you're looking for. It's best for you and your family. And then we will be able to work with multiple companies that are looking for someone like you. Uh, and, and we want to make a match. We want to make sure that uh, all of the company's objectives and requirements uh, are clear and concise. We also want to make sure that you as an individual, uh, that you can, I believe Ian said it, you want to go in and you want to bring your whole self 
uh, to a role, whether you know uh, whether on site or or remotely, um, and you want to enjoy what you're doing. And so for us, that's another big part of what we do. Uh, we love what we do, and we want to make sure that we're working with individuals uh, and companies that appreciate. Um, they understand uh, that it is hard to identify and, and land good talent. And then finally, um, challenge you to grow in your prospective roles so that, so that you are lear, uh, able to learn new skills uh, quickly and to stay abreast uh, of the things that's going to be critically important to make you the best individual contributor. Um, opportunities, uh, like I said, we're partnering with, uh, with multiple companies, multiple verticals. Um, our partnerships, I mentioned range, uh, not only locally and regionally, but nationally. Um, growth opportunities, public sector, private sector, obviously, finance, healthcare, just to name a few. Uh, and then we really do also value uh, diverse thought, uh, working with inclusive partnerships. Uh, we know that um, a lot of companies are saying that they want diverse backgrounds. They want uh, individuals with MBAs. I heard uh, one of the uh, one of the responses that she started as, you know, she, she received her MBA and now she's looking at going into whatever um, a specific role. For us, we know that there's individuals that are coming from, uh, you know, fire or police or they're coming from uh, working, you know, in manufacturing or and now they're looking to get into something different. And so for us, we want to make sure that we take the time, establish a relationship, understand uh, what exactly you're looking for, make sure it's going to be aligned and a good match with the clients that we represent. And then there obviously are multiple options, full-time, uh, part-time, uh, a long-term contract, short-term contract work uh, that, that really does provide uh, more flexibility and opportunities to continue uh, expanding your skill set, as well as, you know, uh, the reason we all go to work. Uh, financially, it, it's a big deal. So that is an overview. Um, I have, uh, I've already added my information into this uh, chat space with uh, with uh, our company information, MSI Workforce Solutions. Uh, my email, I've, I've placed my email, uh, but you go to our website, www.msiworkforce.com. Uh, there's links, there's information. You can contact us that way. You can contact me on LinkedIn. Um, and we, we are very, very excited that um, we see uh, where this uh, particular um, uh, skill set uh, and training and development is going. Uh, and we know that it's uh, not only a great career opportunity, but it's also great for our community, safe communities online, uh, in our, within our banking systems, within our healthcare spaces. They impact us. And so it's critical that we, uh, we do everything we can. Uh, to be a good vehicle and a good support uh, in the recruiting process. And lastly, I'll say it, I'll put it like this, just like, um, you know, some, you know, pr other professionals uh, sometimes need a partnership. Well, we, we just want to be that partner when needed. So um, that is, that is a brief overview. Um, we, we, uh, we have a lot more that we could say, but we really just wanted to make sure that you guys uh, had an opportunity. If you had questions, uh, and then, you know, with that, I think I see one. What are the length of contracts with MSI? Uh, typically, the lengths of contracts are going to range uh, on the low end, 90, to 90 days to six months, uh, and can typically go up to 24 months with the opportunity uh, for extended time. So they can literally range from short-term projects, um, more than likely a lot of hours, uh, to more conventional 40 hour work weeks over a six month, 12 month, 24 month, or even a 36 month contract. Great question. Hey, Marty, can you put your information in the chat again? I'm not seeing it. So I don't yeah, know yeah. if you did it to just somebody privately or um, if it was public, but if you can stick it in there, there we go. Thank you. You're and welcome. then, uh, yeah, Louis just asked, do you have contracts outside of Tennessee? Um, and it looks like they may be specifically in Washington. Yes, Washington, D.C. or Washington State? Uh, my guess is Washington State. I would think Washington State. Uh, I'll just tell State, everyone yeah. Washington State. So, Louie, I can tell you uh, that there are uh, in-person jobs. There are also uh, remote positions all over the U.S., in Washington State, and all over the world. I think it was Nick or maybe uh, one of the other presenters that literally said, 
uh, due to uh, uh, multinational companies with, uh, you know, some of our companies in the manufacturing sector, you know, uh, they have, uh, they're represented in upwards of, of seven to 10 countries. I think the presenter from Cisco mentioned the, the, the number of spaces or the number of locations. So there are positions that will allow you to uh, be right there in your, your office space at home and work in places, Washington State, uh, as well as throughout the, the world. And so, yes, uh, we don't personally have positions today in Washington state, but what we're seeing with our large and our smaller companies uh, is that there are so many opportunities and they represent so many different verticals that there could be positions that are, are, are available today, filled today, and then they're gonna open up other places. Great, thank you. And then Donna asks, um, and I think you uh, briefly mentioned this with your example: is does MSI um, the the companies that you pair do will they offer medical four hundred one k some of those other um, benefits? Yeah, um, you know, I I will take just a second. That's a great question. The the short answer is yes. And and another thing that um, I want uh, everyone, including some of the companies that are are represented as well. Um, a lot. It, this is there. There is so hard to fill uh, critical positions with highly skilled and talented people. Benefits uh, the ability to access 401k, whether it's on a six month or a, a three year contract. All of these things are critically important. So MSI, you know, we made the determination, uh, you know, as we started this company. Uh, that we would be prepared as, you know, triple minority certified, working with uh, government, non-government, uh, working with large and small companies that we were prepared. So to be completely honest, we're actually, uh, we're, we offer benefits. Uh, uh, of course, there's a, there is a cost to those, but uh, we absolutely are prepared. But most of our clients that we work with, absolutely, that is just one of the, 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 the baselines for employment. Wonderful. Um, and then another question is, do you know if there's any multilingual um, opportunities that you guys have seen that you've worked with? We have current positions that uh, the preference is to be able to speak multiple languages, obviously. And I think one of the presenters mentioned uh, that whether it's, you know, French or, or, or Russian or uh, uh, Spanish or, or, or German, because we're so integrated as, 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 you know, as, as companies and, and, the, and the partners that we work with, uh, you know, you may need to speak Mandarin in, in, uh, in, in one conversation, and then, you know, you may need to be able to speak French in another, and you work under the same company uh, umbrella. So yes, there are opportunities. Uh, in some instances, there's actually, uh, uh, because it is a requirement, uh, sometimes uh, it actually benefits financially to be able to speak multiple languages. Obviously, there's 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 a lot of value to that. Uh, so yes, uh, we do work with companies that do require it. Uh, obviously, for for the the, the clients that they uh, that they support, but then there are some that they would prefer if available. So yes. And then um, it looks like Tom, when he did a search for MSI, um, he said. This MSI is not the MSI that's a Tetra Tech company, correct? The logos look different now that we have started. He seems to have looked at into jobs at the wrong company, it seems. Do you know anything about that? Well, if there's another MSI, good luck to them. Ours is, and I did put the website, msiworkforce.com, msiworkforce.com, and uh, it should take you directly to our website. So we're not the Tetra company. Okay. Um, and then is it correct to say MSI is a human resources and workforce development company representing companies who need to fill cyber and IT jobs? Well, that's a, that's a pretty specific question, but it is, it is absolutely right. And even in all of our information, that's exactly, I, I think someone's taking the time to, uh, to read through our, our website. It was important as we launched this, uh, this company that we were not a staffing company or a contractor company or just an IT company or a healthcare company, but truly, and all of you know this, um, it's great to work with a, a, a group of experts that understand before you accept a position, it's critical that your, uh, your, your recruiting process uh, your engagement uh, with the individuals that uh, that you could be working with is a, is a pleasant one and an informative one. And so for the, the, the HR and workforce development part of this, it is critically important. Uh, we like to say our, our COO, um, you know, I hadn't heard the, the phrase before this, but uh, we, we really do put the human back into human resources, which includes, um, you know, your job search, uh, you know, your, your offer, your, your negotiations, 
uh, you know, your experience, uh, your, your the experience that may not be on a resume or it may not be directed at a specific uh, requirement, but you have transferable skills and that is there's a value to that. So uh, you will have a guide and a partner that says, we know what you're worth, uh, but maybe your additional skill sets or maybe that secondary or third language or, or maybe your ability to travel or whatever it is. We also want to make sure that the value proposition, uh, you know, it, it is applicable to you as an individual. And, and not just a group. Uh, the second part of that, the workforce development. Uh, we have many, many situations to where people will go to work or they'll decline positions and they'll call us back in a year or two and they'll say, you know what? Um, I thought I wanted this position, but there is something that is not going well. Well, uh, you know, we don't, uh, I, I won't go into too much detail, but we offer the MSI Workforce Masterclass. Uh, and that is an in-person and a virtual uh, training and development opportunity. Uh, we offer our own certification because we're covering many things uh, from your job search uh, to your, your social media profiles and making sure that now your footprint on social media is a foot, uh, in essence, a footprint for life. It's critical that, you know, you, you make sure that the right things are there and uh, in case employers go and, and take a look, uh, that, that it does leave a good taste in their mouth. It, we, you know, we talk about preparing for interviews. We talk about uh, that, you know, the keys of emotional intelligence and uh, the, the things that are going to help you not only when you are looking for your position, but how you grow. We want to help and prepare you to be able to grow within your position uh, and you become that next hiring manager or group leader or team leader. And so we have entry level folks that are looking for how to get their foot in the door through our master class. And then we have individuals that feel like, hey, I've been in this job for a couple of years and it feels like I'm not really going anywhere. So we've got sort of another level uh, of, of our certification program that will allow an individual with three to five years of experience and very, very smart, very hardworking. But there is some reason that you're not able to transition as quickly, maybe, a, a, or be promoted like some. And so we are able to sit down with you, uh, have an honest conversation and provide as much a positive feedback preparation and hopefully a successful transition uh, maybe into that secondary uh, uh, position. Great. Um, one of the other questions, um, does MSI have apprenticeship or internship opportunities for new entrants to IT sector, especially from the law enforcement sector? You guys are asking some phenomenal questions. And uh, and to be honest with you, that's, a, that's exactly what we're working on now. Now, obviously, we couldn't go to our current employers and say, hey, listen, uh, you know, are you guys open or uh, uh, willing to do this until, you know, we, we were able to gain more traction. But uh, we're actually having conversations with companies now and, and we're basically using the analogy like a lot of, like how I got my foot in the door. I started out as a as a, a temporary well, that could be an intern, uh, that could be a, a contractor, it could be a variations of that. But mine was, I worked for a company for 30 days or so, they offered me a full-time position, I stayed for 12 years. Well, we feel like there's such high value for the clients, as well as the individuals, if we could have um, a, a structured paid internship, which we We've got the content, we've got the processes, and now we're working with companies to see what their specific needs are so that individuals that want to get their foot in the door, maybe do 90 days, maybe do six months, maybe do a year, uh, whatever it is until you build that, that skill set up uh, and that expansion of, uh, of, of uh, experience, uh, we, we will be offering those. All of that will be on our website, and we will be working uh, collaboratively with Steve and the CWCT group. Uh, to make sure that you guys are well aware when those are available. And we anticipate that being very soon. So great question. Great. Thank you. Um, and just as a refresher, I know you mentioned it earlier, um, but to get started with you guys is the best thing to go to the website or to contact you, um, especially for those who may have come in a little late. How do they get started with you? Yeah. What I, what I want to do is now when you can go to our website and you can go to our career section, you're going to see jobs that are Literally, like I said, some, some of the companies that are represented here, some of these are, are for those companies. What I would ask everyone to do is uh, if, if you could either use the email that I left, marty.low at msiworkforce.com, I'll get that over to you know, our, our head of recruiting, our GM, our team. Uh, this is a specific group. Uh, you can apply through our website. We'll, we'll have your pro, but, but what we would love to offer you guys is uh, connect with us on LinkedIn, uh, send that information directly to me. Uh, I'll make sure that I get it disseminated to the right team members. Uh, and then also uh, info, I-N-F-O at msiworkforce.com. And in the subject, 
just put CWCT graduate and then upload, add your resume uh, and then expect uh, follow-up uh, within 24 to 40, 48 hours just to start the process. Uh, we're gonna find out a little bit more about you by scheduling uh, a pre-screen. Uh, we're gonna allow you to ask questions, uh, but we, we're trying to centralize this specific group uh, because this is unique. We know that some are gonna start out as uh, interns, externs, some are gonna start out uh, in roles uh, that are a little more expansive based on your prior careers or experience. And then some are probably looking for uh, maybe other, other opportunities. So uh, I really feel like uh, that, that we're gonna be able to offer that. But those two emails, obviously I would love in the subjects uh, for it just to be CWCT graduate, uh, and then we're segregating those and, and we'll, we'll start their interview processes, uh, making sure that we have, you know, everything that we need to know about you, uh, salary requirements, relocation, uh, availability, uh, everything that you, you're going to want us to know, we're going to get that in a, in a, you know, in a couple of uh, uh, conversations and uh, virtual or, or phone calls, uh, and then get you prepared to start uh, using some of the networks that are here but also using some of the networks and, and there's just so many opportunities. We're excited uh, to serve and support you guys uh, as you've earned this, uh, this position, so. And that was info at msiworkforce.com, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yeah, I put that in the chat. Yep, Thank I put you. that in the chat for them and I copied your email address again, so. Out, outstanding, any other questions before I, I sort of give a summary uh, and hopefully this does resonate. Any other questions or any other comments or any anything else I can do or or give? Mm, there's no more questions at this time in the chat. So so what I'll say is this, um, you know, the reason we 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 feel that this is uh, going to be a good partnership, uh, I think that a couple of questions are very indicative of what some people are thinking. Um, you know, I don't want to go to a company that I I walk in and it literally is going to take me, you know. I like sort of keeping my head down or I like this, this is my work environment or working with certain people. And so for us, our goal is to make sure that you're, you're, uh, you're absolutely prepared. Uh, we understand what your preference is to either get your foot in the door or make the transition. Um, we've been where you are. And so um, having a, an intermediary, uh, a, a staffing and recruiting partner, HR professionals in the building um, and, and true representation uh, not only at the local, the state level, with multiple uh, organizations, SHRM, uh, uh, we represent uh, at, at a high level. We're proud of that. We represent, uh, you know, uh, our COO is the, uh, the, the newly elected president of the Association of Talent Development for this region and a part of the national network. And so these things are critical uh, as it relates to your individual uh, uh, new opportunity, new career path. Uh, and, and how it's going to positively impact you and your families, as well as these companies that are truly in need of the talent. So we're excited. We're very thankful to be a part of this group. Uh, and if there are not any questions, I'm going to make Christy's job a little bit easier. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give her four more minutes back than, uh, than she thought she was going to get. And, uh, and, and it, like I said, my information is there. Uh, our email is www.msiworkforce.com. Uh, and either the email info, which you should be able to sort of remember that info at msiworkforce.com or marty.low at msiworkforce.com. Uh, I, this is another question, but uh, I, thank you for everything uh, and nice hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank you very much. Uh, so I can now say that I think Ian had the best closing I've ever had. I've never had somebody <laughs> present and sing a song. And I don't know that I've, I don't know that I've ever had somebody say that uh, about the haircut, but you make an old gray headed guy feel good. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, all right. I saw Kelly come on. Um, so Kelly is going to be with Four Block. Uh, Four Block is dedicated to supporting service members. Um, so if you are, I mean, if, if you want to stay by all means, but if you are not military, this may not be as um, uh, 
as fitting for you. So you may want to hop on into one of the other breakout rooms. Again, you're more than welcome to stay if you wish, but they are more geared toward helping um, service members who are transitioning from military to civilian careers. So um, just to give you an idea for that. And Kelly, you are here, right? Oh, yes. She okay. All right. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce you really quick. Um, so Kelly is with Four Block, um, which is a nonprofit dedicated to supporting service members who are transitioning from the military to civilian careers. They built a professional network where veterans can connect locally and attain the skills, resources, and relationships to enter their chosen career path. This is accomplished through their career readiness program and other uh, resources. Um, do you guys work with first responders or fire service members, or is it just military? It's just military okay. and, mili and military spouses. And military spouses. Okay, Gabriel, hopefully that answers your question. That was a very first question in the chat. So military <laughs> and military spouses. So um, go go ahead. Uh, you've, got, you've got a half hour. Oh, wow. Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> most have a... not been taken the full half hour, <laughs> okay. so we're staying on schedule. Uh, yeah, okay. most are just introducing themselves, what their organization does, how do they get started with you guys. Um, it is being recorded for those who can't make it, um, and then we'll, we'll do kind of a Q&A. Sure. Okay, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelly Fluharty. I am uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I am an Army veteran. I uh, have been working, well, I started out with Four Block as a, a student in the very first cohort that we had in spring of 2019. And uh, I started working with them uh, as a volunteer it, uh, the next semester. And then I started as a career readiness instructor in the fall of 2020. Uh, so this is my fourth semester that I'm working with them. Uh, so we work on a semester basis and we have a 10 week program where we talk about all of the things, uh, career readiness that maybe you didn't get when you were exiting the military uh, in the TAP program. Uh, the military doesn't, we all know, doesn't do a great job in, in getting us ready for an, a career. And that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, the military does a fine job of helping you find a job uh, or getting you ready for a civilian job, but not necessarily for a career. And part of the problem that, that we've all run into is that you find a job and within a year or two, you, you, don't, you don't like that job anymore and you leave. And so 4Block was created to help find meaningful careers uh, on the civilian side for those military members who are transitioning. And so by transitioning, we mean that you are active duty and you are within 12 months of, of uh, ETSing, or you have been out of the military for a couple of years, but maybe you're back and you know, you, you're you using your GI Bill and you're going to college and getting a degree. So uh, everyone, should have at least a bachelor's degree to go through the program. Um, and so during those 10 weeks, we work with a number of large corporations in the Charlotte area. Uh, <clears throat> they are sponsors for uh, the program. And pre-COVID, obviously, we were meeting at these locations. So like our lead sponsor in Charlotte is Wells Fargo. So when we would have our weekly meeting, we have a meeting once a week, the rest of the work that you do is online. Uh, we would meet at Wells Fargo and we would be able to actually network with a lot of really uh, high players at Wells Fargo or at whatever company it is that we're, we're working with. So we talk about things like your elevator pitch. We uh, go over resumes, how to you know create like a master resume and then how to to define that down to a targeted resume for specific positions that you're applying for. We talk about interview skills um, and networking and uh, talk about getting mentors and things like that. We try also to uh, place a coach with each person so that there's myself and I have a, uh, another career readiness instructor, Paul Bill, who works with me. Um, but we just can't get to every student. We try to keep the, the cohorts about 25 students every semester. 
we just can't spend time with every one of them every week. So we try to find uh, coaches that will work with them. And so those coaches are people a lot of times from these companies who are sponsors and they volunteer time to work with one or two uh, service members throughout the cohort. Um, and uh, I can tell you that we have, um, in addition to Wells Fargo, we work with PwC. Uh, we work with Truist. They're a, a new uh, sponsor that came on last year. Um, we work with Spectrum. Uh, we have in the past worked with Lowe's. We still have a really good uh, uh, relationship with Lowe's, but they haven't worked with us while we've been specifically online. Um, we also have uh, Jeffries, which is another financial services company. We have Data Miner, which is a data analytics company. Um, and I know there's someone I'm leaving out, but, uh, but those are some of the big players that we work with. Then we also have, because we are a nationwide organization, um, if someone who comes through the Charlotte cohort decides after they finish, hey, I think I'm going to move to Dallas, then we have people that we can connect them to in that area as well. Um, and can I can I ask you a question since it's sure. right there? So a lot of our participants are already located in other areas. So if they start mm -hmm. in other areas, would you guys work with them as well? Absolutely. So we have um, in the southeast region, we have five. So there's Atlanta, Charlotte, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, Tampa and Orlando. So we have five locations in uh, the Southeast region. We also have uh, cohorts, I believe, in DC and, and New York City. Um, we have some in Texas, and I'm not sure of all the cities in the other regions, but we have uh, some out in, uh, I think, Seattle and LA. Um, I think we're getting one in Phoenix. But in addition to that, especially since the COVID has hit, we have created some virtual locations because we also wanted those people who live in areas like maybe Boise, Idaho, and we don't have anybody in, you know, we don't have a co cohort in Boise. So we have a, a virtual East, a virtual Central, and a virtual West. So even after COVID, if we finally go back to being in person with people, we'll still have those three virtual cohorts. So if they're in a location where we don't have a cohort, they could definitely join a virtual one. Um, but but we have locations kind of all over the country. Great, thank you. And sorry to interrupt, but it was the no perfect problem. time to ask that because I knew it was <laughs> going to get asked. Absolutely. And we have tried to do some uh, some kind of across the, uh, the way um, networking online. Since we're, since we're online, we were like, we might as well do a, a happy hour one week and kind of invite everyone to come. And so we'd really like to try to do that again maybe this year. Um, so in order to apply, uh, you would need to go to fourblock.org, and there is an apply button. And in the application, it'll ask you things such as obviously all your pertinent information. And then um, also it'll ask, you know, your, your uh, uh, service, you know, what, what branch of service you were in, your rank. Uh, you know, when you're, when you got out or when you're getting out your education um, and uh, I believe which, which one you would, you know, which area, which location you'd like to attend. Um, and then uh, th we also have a program for military spouses. I don't know as much about that program because I'm not involved in it, but I do know if you go to fourblock.org, I'm sure you could find that as well. Yeah, I went ahead and put that uh, that link in the chat for them, and, and I believe you. the chats are going to be recorded, so that they'll have that information. But <laughs> I put that in the chat. Um, are there any? Um, one of the participants says that virtual Texas is closed, so I don't know. Do they fill up? Are there only so many they, spots they left? They do fill okay. up. So, like I said, we like to keep our classes at about twenty five people, and that now, and I'm speaking for the southeast area. I don't know kind of what the other locations do, but in the Southeast, I know my director likes to keep us at about 25 students. 
I know right now going into the spring, I have 31 students, but we know attrition will happen. There'll be a couple of people that once it gets started, something will happen. They'll need to drop or, you know, defer to the next semester. Uh, but we try to keep it around 25. And, about and we have a, how often do new cohorts start? Uh, so we do a fall and a spring semester. So they, we start recruiting uh, probably about March or April for the fall and get really, really into it and, you know, in the summer. And then in the fall around October, we'll start recruiting for the spring semesters. Okay. So William was the one who asked that. William, keep an eye on it, it sounds like. Yes. Um, and uh, so, like I said, they're 10 weeks. Some, some locations do 11 weeks. Uh, but we in Charlotte, we do 10 weeks. And uh, like I say, we meet with a different. So since we're not going to those locations, if we relocate from one state to Florida, will you still work with that individual? Absolutely. Uh, and, and if if we don't pers if I didn't personally work with you, I would turn you over to someone that I feel very strongly would would definitely help you out. Um, every I believe. Almost all of the instructors, or maybe all of our instructors, are veterans. I know a brief overview of what a cohort entails, like time commitment each week. I would say probably five hours a week, uh, and that would include the night that we meet. So when we meet, we meet on Wednesday nights in Charlotte. Uh, we meet from 6.30 to 8.30, and uh, we ask that you attend, uh, we, we obviously want you to attend every week, but if you, if you are absent without letting us know what's going on, you know, there's always something, you know, things come up, people get sick, uh, work, travel, things like that, we know happens. Uh, if you're absent more than three times without some kind of communication, then we, we drop you. But we, I try to communicate with everyone. As soon as someone is absent, I'm sending them an email, you know, if I haven't heard from them. We have a good, a good group usually, you know, lets us know that they're not going to be there. Uh, we actually had a guy last semester who was having surgeries kind of all through the cohort and was showing up, you know, with a neck brace on. And he's like, I'm going to be off camera because I don't want everyone to, <laughs> to, to see me, you know, looking with this big neck brace on. Um, so in addition to those uh, two hours that we meet on Wednesday night, I would say there's two to three hours of kind of just reading material, you know, preparing your resume, preparing uh, your targeted resume and things like that during the week that you would be doing. Absolutely. Hey, Kelly, um, I know I'm popping around to a bunch of different groups, but I wanted to at least shout out while I was in here that I am in this next cohort for four blocks. So super excited right. for the Charlotte I, cohort starting this month. So uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Great, great organization here. I'm just wanted to, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I'm trying to pop around and manage everything. So I'll be sure, back. No problem. Thanks. That's what I do when we're on. <laughs> so the first, so um, I'll talk about also kind of how the, the evenings go. So we'll log in and we always log in about six o'clock, you know, to make sure that the, the Zoom is working and cameras are working and things like that. Volume is working. Um, and we allow students to log on as soon as they'd like to. And, you know, two or three weeks into the semester, they are always starting to, you know, people are getting to know each other and they'll log on and we'll start talking to each other. Uh, but we start the program at 6.30. Uh, we go over whatever the, the issue is, but you know, whatever it is that we're learning that week, whether it's resumes or networking, or we also uh, work with LinkedIn. So there's one week where we have someone from LinkedIn who comes on and talks to us about how to create your LinkedIn profile, you know, and the resources that you can use with LinkedIn. Um, and we'll talk about what the, the issue, the subject was for the week for about 20 minutes. And then our, uh, sponsors will come in and they'll talk. Typically there's someone in that group from the sponsor organization who are veterans. A lot of times they're going to be the veteran recruiters as well. Um, and so someone from that organization will talk about their transition experience and their experience at this particular company. 
uh, they'll talk for a few minutes. <clears throat> and then the last hour, we really try to um, go into breakout rooms. And so, excuse me. So we'll have uh, typically about four or five breakout rooms and we try to have two to three people from the host organization that are in each breakout room. So people are able to ask them specific questions about working for that company, the jobs, how do you get on, how do you apply, who do I need to talk to, things like that. Then we come back for just a few minutes and uh, and then we'll we'll hold a little after party afterwards after 830 for about 15 minutes for anyone who has questions that they didn't get answered during the during the event. All right. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions for Kelly? I don't think I saw any more. Yeah, come up in the chat. I haven't Let's seen see. any come through. Overview of a cohort in Yeah. Tales. Okay. Yeah, you got that so one. So they they are so the the work during during the week is kind of at your own pace. So you start that you know, after we've met on Wednesday night. Um, and then the Wednesday night, though, is live. And it is recorded um, so that I send that out usually on Thursday or Friday of that week, along with contact information for everyone that was there from the host company. Okay. All right. And uh, just, just to... Um, reiterate in case anybody came on late um, in order to get started with this program they just go to the website which is just fourblock.org correct correct okay great that way they they have that in case they came on late and didn't catch that um if there are no okay here um the virtual ones are having sponsors that offer remote positions so um i know uh yes I don't know. I can't guarantee that every organization is offering remote positions. I do know, uh, for instance, Wells Fargo being our uh, lead sponsor, they've all been pretty much remote for the last two years. And I know that they're trying to come back into the office, but they're, you know, there are going to be remote positions. I think with the great resignation, and COVID and everything else, I think there are just going to be more remote positions than in the past anyway. Um, and that's definitely a question that can be asked while you're talking to them is, you know, do you have remote positions or hybrid positions or whatever? And is it safe to assume that each um, area for four block is going to have different sponsors, like the sponsors you listed were from the North Carolina area? So somewhat, so like Wells Fargo has a huge nationwide wide presence. So they are a sponsor in uh, Charlotte. I'm pretty sure they're a sponsor in Atlanta. I know they're going to be a sponsor in Phoenix because they have a huge Phoenix uh, and, in, and in LA, you know, because they're based out of San Francisco, but they have a huge, uh, Charlotte is their second largest base. Um PwC has a nationwide presence. Uh, you know, Lowe's has a nationwide presence. LinkedIn is is a sponsor with every location. Um, so yeah, there will be some differences. I'm trying to think. Uh, so like in Atlanta, Delta is a big sponsor, but Delta doesn't really have a huge presence in Charlotte, so they're not a sponsor. I'd love to get American Airlines to be a sponsor, but I haven't found a way in there yet because we have a big American Airlines hub in Charlotte. So uh, we're always looking for new sponsors. We always listen to, also one of the things that we ask people to do every week, and I know that's terrible when you think about it, but it literally takes 45 seconds as we ask for us, everyone to do a small survey, all of the service members, the, the companies do also, we send them a survey as well. And we read those surveys every week and we have been known to make changes in our delivery of the materials uh, mid mid cohort. <laughs> so that's another one of the requirements is to, to do some surveys, but they're very short to the point surveys each week. 
and then you'll do a survey before at the beginning of the cohort and then one at the end to kind of gauge you know how you felt the program was i will say that we have a great uh rate of people being and i don't have those numbers with me but i'm happy to send those out to steve so he could send them out but our graduation rate our rate of employment uh, I do know I saw something the other day that the vast majority of people who are employed through a four block cohort employed at one of the agents at one of the companies, it's typically, uh, I think the average starting salary is like 90,000. Great. Right. Are there any other questions? not seeing anything. Um, okay, that wraps up. I think you were the last speaker in our particular room. So if there's no more questions, um, participants, you can go on to one of the other um, into one of the other breakout rooms and catch the last 10, 12 minutes of uh, those presentations. Um, you just need to click at the bottom uh, where it says join breakout room. You might have to click on the more button. Um, uh, but yeah, at oh, Steve. As well, sorry, oh, yeah, I'm there, not trying to step on. No, toes. yes, um, yeah, there is. Most most of the speakers do end at. Um, hold on, I'm on Central Time Zone. So <laughs> most end <laughs> at nine o'clock um, Eastern, uh, eight Central. But there is going to be Red Canary is speaking at eight thirty in one of the breakout rooms. So you know you can always um, join that one. It'll be listed in. Uh, no, red, 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 red hat. hat. Yeah, red. Oh, I have it yeah. wrong on the agenda. I deleted the wrong one. Okay, red hat is speaking at eight thirty in one of the rooms. Uh, great. <laughs> it's it's late. Um, but yeah. So Kelly, thank you. Um, uh, thank you Kelly. And is is if they have further questions, should they just go to the website? Should can they contact you? Can you put your email address in the? Uh, the chat for us. Wonderful. So there's <laughs> Kelly's chat or uh, email address for anybody who um, who needs it. So thank you, Kelly. So yeah, if you Absolutely. guys want uh, want to join one of the other rooms or join Red Hat at 830, um, you can do so. Um, and thanks, Kelly. Thank, thank you so much, you. Kelly. Talk soon. See you soon, Steve. Bye. Bye.